Welcome to the City of Bakersfield Planning Commission meeting. This television broadcast is made available through cooperation with the local cable companies, the County of Kern, and the City of Bakersfield. The Planning Commission meets on the first and third Thursdays of each month. You can watch the rebroadcast of this meeting Saturday at 7 p.m. and Sunday at 10 a.m. The planning meeting agenda is posted on the city's website at www.bakersfieldcity.us. Presiding over today's meeting, Chair Larry Komen. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to call to order the November 5th, 2020. I'm sorry. Yeah, it is 2020, isn't it? Planning Commission meeting. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Komen. Here. Commissioner Rudnick. Here. Commissioner Bell. Here. Commissioner Bowers. Here. Commissioner Cater. Here. Commissioner Lomas. Commissioner Lomas. Commissioner Lomas is here. Out. <laughs> yeah. We'll get back to her. Commissioner Wade. Here. So Ms. Lomas is here. Here. On March 4th, the governor, uh, on March 4th, Governor Newsom declared a state of emergency in California due to the threat of COVID-19. Governor also passed several executive orders related to social distancing, shelter at home, practices, and more. These orders also include the suspension of some components of the Brown Act related to public meetings like this one. Uh, we do not have any commissioners uh, participating versus via video, so we'll just skip that. Uh, let's see here. All right then, uh, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Looks like we have a full house tonight, so thank you for attending tonight's planning commission meeting. This commission provides an opportunity for public participation in the development process throughout the city of Bakersfield. The Planning Commission considers a wide variety of projects, including subdivision maps, zone changes, general plan amendments, and more. When applications are received, the city planning division analyzes the request. Planning staff will present the facts about the project along with their recommendation to the Planning Commission, who will approve the item or make a recommendation as appropriate. Our goal is to carefully consider each project and make a decision that will balance individual rights with public welfare and the general well-being of the community. We will now receive public statements. This time is reserved for anyone wishing to address the Commission on any matter not on the public hearings portion of the agenda. If you are here on items 5A through 5E, this is not the time to speak. Does anyone in the audience wish to address the commission? If so, please come forward and state your name. Okay, we'll now move on to the consent calendar non-public hearing items. These items, these agenda items typically involve housekeeping or administrative matters that do not require a public hearing. Does any commissioner wish to remove a consent calendar non-public hearing item for separate considerations? Yeah, yeah. 
Then may I have a motion to adopt staff recommendation on the consent calendar non-public hearing items. Commissioner Cohen. Uh, I'd like to note that I will not be voting on item uh, 4B based on uh, conflict of interest source of income. Thank you. So then, uh, Madam Clerk, can you separate those votes, please? Okay. Uh, do I still need a motion from somebody? I'll make that motion. Thank you. I'll second. Motion by uh, Commissioner Lomas and the uh, second uh, by uh, uh, Commissioner Rudnick. Sorry. <laughs> so I drew a blank. So I apologize. Um, Madam Clerk, would you please uh, do the roll call vote separating those two items, please? Commissioner Coleman for item. This is for consent calendar non public hearing item A. Commissioner Coleman. This would be 4A. Correct. 4A. Commissioner Coleman. Yes. Commissioner Rednick. Yes. Commissioner Bell. Yes. Commissioner Bowers. Yes. Commissioner Lomas. Yes. Commissioner Wade. Yes. This is for um, item 4B, consent calendar public hearing, non-public hearing. Commissioner Coleman. Yes. Commissioner Rednick. Yes. Commissioner Bell. Yes. Commissioner Bowers. Yes. Commissioner Lomas? Yes. Commissioner Wade? Yes. I need to make an, uh, an adjustment. I didn't call Commissioner Cater for item A. He abstained from B, correct? Correct. So on item 4A, yes. Thank you. Okay. Do did we publish the results of that? Or do we have to? It's just a roll call, Chair. Okay, Definitely. we're good? All right, yes. thank you. All right, we'll now move on to the consent calendar public hearing items. <clears throat> this next agenda section includes public hearing items that are considered routine and non-controversial. These items have been reviewed by staff and are conditioned in accordance with the requirements of the municipal code. The planning director will read the items on the consent calendar to ensure that the public has an understanding of the items to be considered. If you would like to speak on an item, please come forward after the items are read and ask that the item be removed for discussion. If the item is not removed by a member of the public or a commissioner, the commission will vote on all items in one motion without further comment. Uh, Director Johnson, would you like to read the uh, items, please? Thank you, Chair Coleman. Good evening, commissioners, members of the audience and public that have attended tonight. Thank you. There are five items on the consent agenda. The first two items, as displayed on the screen, are three-year extensions of time for two vesting tentative track maps. Map 6191 is located at the southwest corner of Paladino Drive and Morning Drive, consisting of 281 single-family residential lots on approximately 84 acres. Map 7325 is located south of Panorama Drive, west of Morning Drive, consisting of 68 single-family residential lots on approximately 18 acres. Items 5C and 5D are conditional use permits for two wireless communication facilities. Item 5C is a 73-foot tall Verizon cell tower camouflaged as a pine tree located at 3819 River Boulevard in the neighborhood commercial zone district. Item 5D is a 98-foot tall Verizon cell tower camouflaged as a pine tree located at 4516 District Boulevard in the light manufacturing zone district. The last item on the consent agenda is a referral from City Council to amend the Bakersfield Municipal Code related to parking requirements within the Central District, Old Town Kern, and other mixed-use area. This concludes reading of the consent agenda items. Thank you, Director Johnson. At this time, I will open all the consent calendar public hearing items. 
Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak on a consent calendar public hearing item? Again, this is not the time to take testimony. Does any commissioner wish to remove a consent calendar public hearing item? Uh, Commissioner Cater? Yes, I'd like to request that item 5E be moved to the public hearing portion of the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now up to the same tab now, so I'm, I'm good to go. <laughs> All, right. All right, so that was 5E? Okay, thank you. At this time, the public hearing on all the consent calendar and public hearing items not removed are now closed. May I get a motion to adopt staff's recommendation on the consent calendar public hearing items not removed, incorporating all staff memoranda and revised staff recommendations? I'll make the motion to adopt. Commissioner I'll second. Wade. Who was the second? Bowers. Mr. B uh, Commissioner Bowers, the second. Yeah, you gotta be fast. <laughs> you, it's like a game show. Commi Commissioner Conan, you can do vote on your pads if you wish. I'm sorry. You can vote on your notepads if you wish. I don't know. Do we know how to do it? <laughs> we'll let's try that. All right, we're gonna try this, uh, Madam. Well, I guess we're gonna vote. Are we gonna vote now? Sure. All right, now we're gonna vote now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't see it here. I think um, I'll try to bang on it or something. I don't know. Oh, here we go. All right. Oh, you got to put your uh, name in. Uh, uh, can you uh, ra can you radio the tech support and have him sign Mr. Uh, Mr. Brednick in? Patrick, can we sign Commissioner Rudnick in? Or we can just do a roll call vote. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. <coughs> Madam Clerk. Okay, so uh, oh, I'm sorry. That was for items 5A through 5D, correct? Correct. Okay, it is now time to hear the consent calendar public hearing item removed for that portion of the agenda. Before we begin, I want to explain how each hearing will be conducted. Staff will first give a report, then those in favor of the project will be allowed to speak. Those in opposition to the project will be able to speak after all those in favor have spoken. Each side will be given five minutes to provide rebuttal or comments. Individual speakers may ask questions during their statements, but the questions will not be answered until the public hearing on, on that item is closed. Written comments may be given to the clerk who will provide copies to the commission. Please be respectful, respectful of others participating in the hearing by not repeating the remarks of previous speakers and presenting any new comments on thoughts in a concise and clear way. Uh, Director Johnson, would you like to read the, uh, the item in question 5E? Actually, Chair Coleman, since that is a staff-initiated item, we're going to go ahead and move that to the end. Uh, we'll move that to 6C. So if we can, we're going to go ahead and start with 6A, which is the All zone right, change. Yeah. Good. Well, let's just get right to it. Okay. Let's 
Six. We're moving on to 6C. 6 6A. 6 6A. All right, here we go. So if you'd like, I'll go ahead and present this project. Yeah, why don't you just go ahead and present those items that are on the uh, public hearing section over there. Thank you. Six Thank a, you. 6A is a request for zone change and classification from CO, Professional and Administrative Office Zone, to C2, Regional Commercial Zone, on approximately six and a half acres. The project site is located at the northeast corner of Stockdale Highway and Coffee Road. Although staff has not received any opposition to this zone change or the proposed development, this project is being presented to your commission since there has been an interest in this undeveloped corner. On page four of your staff report, there is background information and timeline of this site, but I wanted to focus on what is being considered tonight, which is the zone change and what that is intended to facilitate, which is a transitional care facility. The C2 zone district allows for development that provides a broad range of goods and services which serve the metropolitan market area. Should the zone change request be approved, the applicant will develop the site with an approximately 81,750 square foot transitional care facility. The facility will provide 170 beds and a variety of services that include physical, occupational, speech and language therapy, subacute services, vision and dental consult, stroke, cardiac and diabetic care, orthopedic care, registered dietitian, social services, complex surgical care, and community reentry and discharge planning. The transitional care facility has been processed separately through the site plan review. This process provides city departments such as building, planning, fire, water resources, engineering, traffic, and solid waste the opportunity to review the project and ensure the plans adhere to all applicable development standards, policies, and ordinances. To ensure, com to ensure compliance with applicable standards uh, for the transitional care facility, the site plan review, the, excuse me, the conditions for the site plan review are attached to the, your staff report for reference. As previously stated, staff has not received any comments in opposition to the zone change. This may be in part to the developer's neighborhood outreach by engaging with the community, providing feedback, updates, and renderings to various organizations and groups. The developer held their first meeting in 2020, pre-COVID, with 150 neighborhood residents in attendance. Prior to COVID, the developer has continued to engage with the public through other means of communication. Uh, based on available information, staff recommends that your commission approve the requested zone change to C2 and recommend the same to City Council. However, noting that your, com your commission's interest in this site, there are options. Number one, a motion can be made to approve the applicant's request to the C2 zone. Number two, a motion can be made to approve the more restrictive C2 zone with the PCD overlay. This would allow your commission the opportunity to review and approve development, including the transitional care facility, at a later date. It should be noted the PCD overlay does not restrict development to just the facility, but would allow other uses listed in the CO, C1, and C2 zones should the facility not be constructed. Number three, a motion can be made for approval of the more restrictive exclusive PCD zone. This would allow your commission the opportunity to review the development, including the transitional care facility, but final approval is by city council. Should the approved development not commence construction within three years, your commission could consider whether to rescind the PCD zone back to CO. However, as with the C2 PCD zone, it does not restrict development to just the facility, but would allow other uses listed in the CO, C1, C2. If your commission is concerned with the transitional care facility that it will not be constructed and you do not want to provide for other potential commercial uses beyond the current CO zone, then a motion can be made to deny that zone change request. Again, based on available information, staff is recommending your commission approve the requested zone change to C2. This completes staff's presentation. Thank you. The public hearing on this item is open. Is there anyone who wishes to speak in favor of the project? If so, please come forward and identify yourself and proceed. Good evening. My name is Jose Lynch. And uh, sorry, I have a few notes here. Thank you, first of all, to the Planning Commission for, for hearing this, um, the city, um, community members, and all the attendees that have shared an interest in the, in the project. 
Um, we've we've made some nice neighborhood friends, and I saw a couple of them in attendance as well. Um, on our team, we have uh, myself. I'm the CEO of Pursue Health. Um, I am one of two partners that own the facility. We closed on the land in February of 2020. We have um, Mary Robinson and Joe Sexton. They're both part of our development team, work for Pursue Health. And uh, Greg and Gladys from Greg and, and Maido Architects and Associates, they're here to answer any questions. They specifically specialize in healthcare um, the architecture and predominantly just do that. So we, we actually purchased the property on the whim from the feedback from the community that it was a needed project. Um, most of the times that we've closed on land, we wait for a zoning change and or a CUP to have in, in place, but we felt good about this one. Um, we initially went to the city and they um, very quickly pointed us to the neighbors to get them on board. And we went and presented to the neighbors. Um, it, 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 from what we had learned, it was a very contro controversial piece of land with a lot of uh, previous attempts to, to, to do certain things on the land. So we explained it to them. Um, it was a large gathering. We actually commented back with questions. We've had subsequent lunches. Um, they were very particular as to um, egress, ingress on the property, how it looked, how it was landscaped, um, and variety of different things. Um, about 99% of it was, was favorable, a few um, local um, folks wanted a couple changes and variations that we couldn't make because of various easements on the property, but generally it was, um, it was a very well-received project. A little bit about, about the facility. Um, it's a transitional care facility. Um, there's only been, to, to our knowledge, um, about 15 of these facilities new built in California in the last 12 years. Um, we have built three of those 15 and this would be our fourth. We've completed projects in the last five years in Lancaster, Marietta, and have one under construction in Victorville, California currently. Um, we believe there's a huge need um, for a modernized facility of transitional care. Your typical patient would be a post-hospitalization post patient that may have fractured their hip, had a stroke, had a cardiac issue, and um, a large line share percentage of the, of the patients would actually come for rehab and, and return to a home or a lower lower setting. Um, one of the uh, one of the advances in, in in or one of the advantages of building new um, a lot of different things, particularly with COVID on on room air exchange, negative pressure rooms, etc. So a lot more spacious. Um, there's a lot more requirements, obviously, um, more private rooms, more semi-private rooms, larger space. Um, so we've been in, I've been in the business um, since I was right out of college and done nothing but this. And um, we have, I've been in the space for a long time. And we've never bought land and not started a project um, and completed a project um, since I've been with the company. Um, again, we do own the land. Um, I have, we have no intentions of flipping the land. Um, we were really committed to this, to this space and this project. Um, there is a, a lot of new regulations that have come up on the design um, from, the C from CMS and the federal government. So we had to redesign this project over our last three projects that we've completed in California. But we think it's even more advanced than it was. So it would be 80,000 square feet, plus, plus 80,000 square feet. It takes up the entire 6.4 acres. There'll be a perimeter around it. And uh, we, we listen to a lot of the neighbors and with concerns on height. Um, homeless entry, all those things. So we think, we actually truly believe it would be the best use for the, prop for the property. Um, we initially, when we met with the city, they had suggested the, what we would need to do with the zoning, and we, f we followed that. So we have all the plans you've seen from the screen. And, and with that, I just, um, we would really just like to move forward. Um, we've, we've owned it since f February. Um, I, we know because of COVID there's been a delay um, in what it means to move forward for us is we, we, we would not just start breaking ground tomorrow. So in order for us to move forward, we have, we have, you know, beyond the cost of the project, we have a lot, we have half a million into it already, but the, the work really starts when we, when we formally engage our architects with OSHPOD in the state of California. There's a long process and we believe the shortest in a perfect world, we can get all of the structural and all of that 
approved through Oshpot in hopefully between seven and ten months and begin you know, subject to, to building permits, begin some of the, the grading and those things prior to that if approved. Um, so the project does take a, a while to get started. So um, even though whatever you decide today, it, it, it's, it's a, not a short process. And I think that's just with this, the rules and regulations around Oshpod construction. And that's um, pretty complicated these days. So we'd just like to really just move forward. Um, and with, with your approval, we'd like to just get going and, and, and start you know, really engaging all their architects. We have a general contractor that's been preliminary vetted. They've built our last, they're in the, currently building our current project in Victorville, and we expect to use that same general contractor as well. They specialize in, in this space as well, and um, we think this would be a great, a great use for um, this land and for the community. Should I go back for, or do you guys want to ask me questions? And I, we, I think we need to take all comments first before we can have questions. So we'll just stay. We'll just sit right there in the front row, and we'll get to you with questions if the staff has, or, or commission has any questions, or wherever you can sit. Yeah. Is anybody else in favor of the project that would like to speak? Uh oh. Hi, my name is Gary Simmons. We've met a few times in the past year or so. Regarding the development of that corner, there has been a lot of controversy there over the last year or so uh, regarding what was going to go in there. And with a tremendous amount of neighborhood uh, observation, whether it be Stockdale Estates, Old Stockdale, Amberton, uh, Quailwood, the Shores, the Vineyards, Cal State Baker's Hill, there was a tremendous amount of attention brought forward on, on that particular location. Some of it we like to forget, and I'm sure you would too. It was uh, rather temptuous at times. But I wanted to tell you that as far as representing the community of, of our neighborhood, Stockdale Estates, uh, and the surrounding neighborhoods, uh, Quailwood, uh, the uh, the project that Mr. Lynch is bringing forward to here is well received. There has been no opposition whatsoever. Now, when we had the other builder and the other investor, there were 1,200 signatures. And this room was packed full of opposition people numerous times. There has been zero opposition that I know of, and I'm the guy they call and blast away about what the hell is going on down there on the corner again. We met uh, Mr. Lynch at Stockdale at a due, probably a due diligence meeting, 150 people in a room, little or no agitation. Good listeners, it was a great presentation. And as a community agitator here, just a little bit, I'm just self-describing myself a little bit, we gave him a list of 21 questions to answer. The next day at four in the afternoon, I had a complete answer to all 21 questions regarding everything that I asked him. Everything was transparent. Another list of questions sent. Immediately, within 24 hours, a list of answers. I felt good about it. I'm a businessman. I've been in business for 37 years. I work in extremely high sensitive and high finance uh, situations every day of my life. So I vetted and I backgrounded the organization. And everything came out squeaky clean. And you know, that was a surprise in, in, in high business. I probably have received 20 to 25 emails from their organization upon my request for information. Dozens of phone calls. We had a community luncheon with 17 people, physicians, attorneys, neighborhood people. It was a two and a half hour lunch. Everything was perfect. And myself, I'm always looking for that little thing that just might show up, that might point something in a different direction, never happened. So I want to let you know that you have a very difficult job. And I know a lot of you are in business and a lot of you take a lot of risk in, in business. 
This is a win-win-win for that street corner. This is a win-win-win for the city of Bakersfield. An 80,000 square foot facility that's dedicated to save lives and improve people's health, especially COVID shows up this year. It's a real eye-opener. And we have an outside business, an outside company, outside investors that are willing to invest millions and millions of their own money into our community, create jobs, save lives, accommodate the surrounding businesses and the surrounding neighborhoods. We couldn't be any happier as a neighborhood. And I mean, not just Stockdale Estates or Old Stockdale. We're talking Quailwood. We're talking the Shores. We're talking the Vineyards. I interviewed every business owner in that uh, complex. And we have some likenesses. My sons are friends of the Sullivan sons from high school. We got nothing but win, win, win. There has been no opposition coming from the neighborhood, the physicians. I interviewed five physicians myself to get their output, to get their intake about this type of industry, because this isn't my industry. So I just want to let you know that the transparency, the acceptance coming from the community couldn't be, uh, they couldn't have received a higher grade. We are happy to see them. We are happy to see them invest millions of dollars of their own money into our community, and we're happy to see them save lives, and we're happy to see them produce jobs. There's always a risk. I understand the risk that, that might, be, but might be there. But the, the positives here far outweigh any risks. So I came here unscripted. I didn't even come here to talk. I just came here to listen. But you guys got my motor running on this one. He, they are very well received in our community, and we want you to know that. If there was opposition, I would tell you who. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Simmons. Is there anyone else that would like to speak in favor of the project? If so, please come forward and state your name. Seeing, seeing none, is there anyone who wishes to speak in opposition to the project? Please step to the microphone, identify yourself, and proceed. Seeing no opposition, does any commissioner have any questions for the public on this item? Remember, this is not the time to express any opinions on the matter. It is only time to ask questions. Commissioner Rudnick. Thank you. Uh, this is for the developer, Mr. Lynch. Uh, what is OSHPOD? I'm not familiar with that term. Sorry, it's uh, Occupational Safety Health Care Development. <laughs> I always butcher it, but it's the uh, it's the basically the hospital uh, building requirement. They they ensure all earthquake uh, code and everything's constructed accordingly. So it's a a three or four levels of, of general construction, how things are anchored, how things are run, okay. how, how pipe gas goes through. So they have to prove every, every step of the way. California regulations, I'm assuming? That's correct, yeah. Okay. So is this similar to like a skilled nursing facility? Would, am I equating that properly? Correct. It would be licensed as a skilled nursing facility. Okay. Um, and the difference is just how, how we, because of the, the way it's designed and the modernness, is, it's really turns into a transitional care facility that's intended to be short term. There will some, be some patients that stay longer term. Okay, good, thank you. Sure. Commissioner, Commissioner Bell. Yeah, would you please, one more thing if I may, if you'll come up, thank you. Yeah, you might want to step here for a minute. Yeah, I wasn't my sure apologies for letting you run right back now. there. <laughs> so uh, my question would be to who you're serving specifically. I saw Medi-Cal and Medicare. Is this a citywide facility? Is it for uh, th folks that have other type of insurance programs? Or are you really just serving? Um, that would be mostly uh, folks that are over 65 or folks that are uh, on Medi-Cal as a result of uh, disabilities, et cetera. What is that intent? Yeah, so it's, we, we serve currently, we, we would serve Medicare, manage Medi Medicare, 
uh, we would be Medi-Cal licensed. We'd serve managed Medi-Cal, private insurance, just private pay, pretty much at any payer type that, that has it. We've never um, restricted any, any payer. Got it. And typically, you know, it just depends on the, the, the type or average patient. If, if a patient is a Kaiser patient, for example, I mean, we've cared for a 25-year-old with two broken legs. We probably the more, norm, the more average patient would be um, a cardiac patient that was in and out of the hospital or a fractured hip, maybe in their mid-70s, 80s, um, coming to us for two or three weeks of of, for therapy, um, IV, IV antibiotics, pain medications, around the clock um, monitoring, and then and then discharging to either home or to a, a lower level of care. Good, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> no other questions from commissioners. Uh, I would ask for rebuttal, but there's nothing really to rebut, <laughs> so we can skip that. I will now close the public hearing on this item and return to the commission for comments and action. Does, does any commissioner wish to speak on this item? Okay, Commissioner uh, Rudnick. Uh, I, I'd like to propose a motion to uh, C2 PCD overlay for this project so we can have a, one last peek at it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, Commissioner Bell? I'll second that. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of hoping we'd get some discussion before we got to motions. <laughs> can, can we? Can we? All right, all right. So let's let's go to Mr. K uh, Commissioner Cater. I'm sorry. Commissioner Cater. Sorry, I hit my mic. Uh, my question is uh, for staff to begin. Uh, Mr. Johnson, in your in your report, um, you had mentioned that if this was if the zone was changed to a PCD, there could be a time limit to completion. If not met, the zoning would refer back to the original zoning, which is CO. And is that exclusive of the PCD zone, or is that an overlay that, or a condition that could be applied to any zone change? Yeah. Good question. Uh, if, if you're looking to add a condition that's more applicable to the exclusive PCD zone, then your motion really should be to go to a PCD zone, exclusive PCD, rather than imposing a condition that is what the PCD is. So that, that, that the time language that you mentioned that refers it back to its previous zoning if the conditions are not met, is that something that's within the PCD zone or is that something that is a condition that we would put on a zone change? That is part of the exclusive PCD zone. The ordinance says if, yep. if construction has not commenced within three years, the planning director shall come back to your commission. Your commission can either add conditions, you can extend that timeline, or we can uh, revert it back to the CO zone. That's, but that's only an exclusive and not an overlay, correct? Exclusive. Okay, thank you. Uh, and to the applicant, just thank you for the presentation. Um, it's, yeah, I'll, uh, I might say more stuff, but I'll let another commissioner speak. All right, Commissioner Lomas. I gotta take this off because I'm not getting enough oxygen to my brain. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna leave that one alone. So. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> that was kind of you. Um, I'm gonna take a minute, so please indulge me. Um, this project, uh, not, this project is, uh, let's, let's start this over again. I'm in favor of the project. I have a problem with the zoning, okay? Is any commissioner, were, were the you, any of you on in 13? You were, you remember. Okay, in 2000, I have to give a little bit of history to, because I do respect um, the, the project very much. In 2013, we had a project before us on this entire parcel of Gosford and Stockdale, very large parcel. Neighbors came out in force. Mr. Simmons, you were probably there. 
um, very well attended by the neighborhood. Uh, and it was originally zoned for apartments and the developer brought commercial office to us. The neighbors were very interested, very vocal, and we put all kinds of, of, of wants and needs and, and restrictions. And that zoning was never changed. It's still CO. But if you all look around, there's a hotel, there's a gas station, there's restaurants, and it's all on commercial office. So the integrity of our zoning was very poor. It was all done under conditional use permit. <sighs> that was quite disappointing to me because I take pride in what we do here. I like to show what is done in your neighborhood in the light of day and that the public has the right to know what's going on. So that was done, but by technicalities or someone that knows how to work the system better than somebody else, it was changed. And now we have a pretty busy corner that didn't have to go through a lot of the hoops that a zone change would have required. So I'm irritated about that, as you can see. Not your fault, Mr. Developer. Um, but. So now what do we have here? What we have here is a wonderful project, and you're asking for C2 zoning. This C2 zoning is not restricted. There is a laundry list in that C2 zoning that can be built there. And it is a hotel, a gas station, a whole bunch of a tire shop. Um, adult entertainment can go there. So it is all, and that is, those uses are by right in that zoning. So if, so then let's move along. So if this developer, which we all know and are assured and we feel real good about the project, but if they decide not to, they can sell this parcel and anything can be built there by right. Now, Mr. Simmons, thank you for coming and speaking for your neighborhood. I bet you didn't know that. So our job is, is to make sure that what you believe is going to happen does happen because that's what you agreed to. So that's what I'm going to try to do, but I'm not getting very far. So I've had conversations with staff, and they're saying, no, you can't do it. No, you can't do it. No, you can't do it. So I'm in a quandary. I like this project very much. I think it'd be a wonderful addition to that corner. I wish the whole project, that whole piece of property was done in the light of day and well planned. But now we're piecing things together, which is not good planning, but I digress. So what do we do, commissioners? What do we do? So I don't want to deny it. I. I want to put restrictions, but staff, I'm sorry, you're not helping. You're not helping, you're not giving us what we need so that we can put in writing, I'm hearing gentlemen's agreements, no, no. We had an agreement with that parcel, it was CO and there's a hotel on it. So no, I need help from staff. Now, commissioners, maybe you guys have an idea, but that's where I'm coming from, so I'm in a quandary. Thank you, Commissioner Lomas. Uh, would any other commissioners like to speak on this matter? Commissioner Bell. So, uh, Barbara, we've actually talked about, I mean, Commissioner, for, forgive me here. Uh, thank you. So, uh, you know, I know that area really, really well. I don't live there. I did live there 30 years ago when I came to uh, Bakersfield and met my cute little wife and all that good stuff. But I know that corner well. I lived in Quailwood. My uh, in-laws live in uh, the estates. Um, Mike, I 100% agree with you that we need to hold on to something. Uh, the C2 PCD doesn't, that, that gives us some, uh, well, gives us, review rights and all that good stuff. We have a new buyer, and that's part of my quandary, is a new buyer and don't want to levy the uh, issues of the past 
necessarily on the new buyer. So, but with that said, uh, I'm in agreement. I would ask that uh, staff, yeah, I don't think there's something between a C2 PCD and a full PCD. And, and uh, if staff would give us a little more input in the way of what our latitudes are within the C2 PCD, what would we get as a benefit of that as a commission? Um, I, I'm aware of C2 very, very much. I know the, lati the latitude of a C2 is amazing. They can do absolutely anything, and we don't see it again. So um, my, my question is, staff, please advise in that area a little more deeply, if you will. Uh, Director, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bell. Are there any other commissioners like to speak on this matter? Mr. Johnson, did you want to, re, uh, to respond? Yes, thank you. <laughs> I, I think what some of the commissioners are looking for, and I'm going to defer to counsel for a response, is a condition of approval that says this is the only use that can be built on this site. And again, I'll defer to counsel on that in a moment. The PCD overlay, or even exclusive PCD, would allow any use in the C2 to go forward. Um, automobile dealership is one of those uses. Uh, so if somebody came in, even if you had the C2 PCD overlay, somebody could come in with an automobile dealership and request that it be put on site. Your commission then has the ability to say, you really don't have the ability to deny that because it's a permitted use, but what you do is have the ability to uh, condition it with certain standards that may go above and beyond the minimum standards. Um, that would require this automobile dealership, for instance, you know, to have a certain style to it that you may not see on any other automobile dealership. Uh, it, it just allows you the more opportunity to impose standards. And again, you would see that project, um, but it's still a project that could be permitted as long as it meets the standards that you impose. Does that answer your question, Commissioner Bell? And commissioners, I would just like to add that um, it would not be legally appropriate for the commission to limit the use to only transitional care facilities. Um, now, if the applicant self-imposes a condition, that would be a different story. Um, but based on our research, we, you cannot limit the use only to one, to the transitional care facility. Because once it goes to C2, like it was mentioned before, there's a litany of permitted uses that are allowed. Uh, Commissioner Cater wanted to speak again. So I think um, talking this through, I think one of the great ironies of this site is that conditional uses exist in zones to clarify language that's not very clear in our municipal code. And the CO zone allows medical office buildings. It does not allow medical rooming facilities. And therefore, we are given a task of requiring it to move into a C2 zone, even though its counterpart that would not receive people overnight would be completely accepted in a CO zone. And to me, the irony of the site is that we had uses that moved far beyond the intent of a CO office zone. And now we're seeing a project that is so close to an office zoning that could use a conditional use permit mm -hmm. to be accepted in a CO zone. And now we're not able to utilize that to bring this project, which is very close to the intent of the original zoning, and so is the conditional use of this within a CO just not an option to us? If I may, thank you, Commissioner Cater. Um, it is because of this site that you have seen numerous changes to the zoning ordinance, which is why the BZA who approved conditional use permits in the past is now dissolved, which is why tonight you've seen two and going to hear a third conditional use permit because it's now at your uh, commission level. Uh, in cleaning up that ability or in cleaning up the action because of this site and not saying that's a bad thing, we also removed a statement which allowed the ability to ask for unlisted uses as a, as a conditional use permit or CUP in, in certain zones. So no, you cannot ask for a CUP for this in the CO zone. 
Uh, one option that could be explored, and again, this is a timing item, is if City Council made a referral to add this use to the CO zone, either permitted or conditionally permitted. Uh, but again, that requires a referral from City Council. Uh, we'll do the research and determine if it's, a, if it's um, compatible with the CO zone. We'll report that back to City Council or the committee, and then that'll go back through Planning Commission, back through City Council for approval for amendment to the ordinance if they so choose. Ms. Lomas would like to speak again. So in the timing of this, is it feasible to, do, to go that route? Is that a question for the applicant or the? No. Oh. Staff. I'm, I'm going to say, um, I mean, obviously we have some new council members coming on board. So some of the agendas are, are a little bit lighter than normal. Um, I'm going to say it's going to take three to four months, maybe a little bit longer to get the ordinance changed if, again, if that's what city council desires. And in your opinion, advantage, disadvantage for the applicant? Because I don't want to torture the applicant. The, that would be a question for the applicant on timing. Could we ask the applicant? Yes, you may. If, if Chair Coleman would like to open it back up to allow the applicant to answer. Sure, the applicant could come up and answer. And if the applicant wants to self-impose any regulations on himself, we'd be happy to hear those. <laughs> OK. So. I, unless I get hit by a bus, I'm not sure if my investment partner would say, let, no, I don't feel comfortable someone else building it. So I, I, get, I get your dilemma, but we, we're just trying to follow the rules that were given to us, and we think we did everything we were asked for so far. So I, I understand the dilemma, and I appreciate all your comments. Um, you know, I, I was thinking to myself earlier, I don't, I don't our, if our attorneys were listening to me, they would tell me, shut up. But if, if you come down the list of all the, the zoning or the, the C2 concerns, the, the, the adult um, strip club, whatever you call it, the gas station, the hotel, I mean, you, you give me a list of items and I'll deed restrict um, it to prevent those things. And I don't even know the list of C2 things. Sorry, I didn't study it that well. It's I was huge. just interested in me. Um, in our project, but we, you know that would be something that we could cross off the list and add it to a deed restriction. If if there's certain projects that you guys can agree that you don't want there, um, that's one. We just want to move forward, and if possible, um, you may not come to a conclusion today. But I want to get a good enough feeling, and I also know that people change in roles in in your role and also in city council. And I don't want to look at everyone in the eye and say, yeah, we, I feel really good, and I'm going to move forward and spend two million dollars. Come to find out that the zoning end or the CUP end or whatever doesn't happen. Um, that's not good for me, and nor good for the city, nor good for you. So we just want to move forward. I want to start spending more and getting it going. I totally understand that if we fail, that you should have a right to get it back to whatever it was. So I'm willing to sign wherever I need to sign to say if it doesn't start, it can go back to whatever it is. Um, but we just want to move forward. Commissioner Bell. Oh, there you go. Uh, if I may, Director, one last question. Mr. Johnson, if I may, one, one last question. Uh, I, I think you're going to say no, but CC or C1 does not fit in an easier category, does it? Are we anywhere closer? The C1 zone does not allow the proposed use. Right, neighborhood. Uh, so the C1 zone would not be of any benefit to the applicant. The CC zone is, allows uses in the CO, C1, C2. So C2, CC zone is actually just a little bit broader than okay. the C2. Thank you. I didn't do any good. So. And we're, we're back to Commissioner Lomas. Okay, how about this? This, and again, I like the project, so we're going to get you there. Just hold on. <laughs> Just got to figure out how to do it. Because I think I, the sense that I have is everybody's very supportive of this. They want to get you there. They want to get you over the finish line. But your project has, has revealed a flaw in something that we've just done. And so I love what, what you brought up in that this touches CO. Okay, so there is a connection here. 
So to me, we should fix that part of our ordinance anyway, because it, there, should, there is that connection that we could have accomplished this with a CUP. Yes, can I get a, eh? Good. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but it's something to, to uh, pursue. So I don't know about this deed restriction thing and w explain, okay, wait a minute, here's my question. PCD, exclusive PCD, is there an extra cost to the applicant for that? Yes, there is. How much? It is, um, one moment. Ballpark. Can we waive the cost? We exactly. Eight thousand. Okay. Since this really isn't his fault, can we waive that cost? No, we cannot. Why not? It would be a gift of city funds. Oh, guess you can't do that. Huh? I should clarify that would be a gift of public funds, not city funds. Public funds. <laughs> At least with the PCD, we've got, we can revert back to the CO and it's not in per perpetuity. I mean, that's all we have and it's not fair, I'm sorry, but it'll get you there. But yeah, I don't know, you guys say something. Uh, Commissioner Cater. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's frustrating because I think um, to see such a good project that I think would bring a lot of great things to our community, but just, um, I, are, so are we open back to ask questions of former speakers? Is that? Yeah, I, I, I think we should. Uh, Chair, would you allow that? Yeah, let's okay. clear it out and ask any questions you like. So who would you like to speak because to? Because I am very appreciative that the, the community, the neighbors have come out tonight and um, sent a representative to s express their support. And so if, if you wouldn't mind if I could ask you a question just about the project. Uh, Mr. Simmons? May I? Oh, yes, please. Sorry, with COVID. Um, because I, I do, I do acknowledge that things change, uses change over time, and what might have been appropriate in 2013 is maybe not what is appropriate now in 2020. But as a neighbor, rep, someone who cares very deeply about their community and their immediate neighbors, if this site were to fall by the wayside, like or this proposal for nobody's fault was to not proceed and this land became you know, a C2 where dry, fast food restaurants, automobile, tire shops were guaranteed by right. I mean, would you as a neighbor feel that that's acceptable or would you feel slighted in the process? We would uh, probably be in opposition to, to that, but I want to commend uh, Commissioner Lomas. I want to commend you on your transparency on revealing fact that some of these things like the hotel and the gas station, I want to commend you on the transparency because we in the neighborhood didn't pay very much attention to that until we found out how that was happening. Mm -hmm. It wasn't your fault. It was brought to you with a certain presentation. It went through the process. Everything appeared benign and it turned out it wasn't. So I want to commend you on your transparency here tonight. It's a public meeting. Uh, you were dead on, you nailed it. So it's the process on how this happens. It's the information gathering on how this happens, the facts, the data on how these things, you cannot make a good decision until you have intelligent data. And part of the system is allowing certain shenanigans to slip through a process. So I want to commend you on your transparency and I want to commend you on your concern. But I also want to say it's almost embarrassing that Mr. Lynch and his investment and his partners are having to listen to this. It's embarrassing. This is on us, not him. He has no intent to deceive this panel. Thank you. Thank you. And I, and I appreciate uh, 
the neighborhood coming out to express their opinions and um, I think he put it spot on is that unintended consequences are one of the things that we as commissioners need to be cognizant of because I, I haven't heard anybody up here um, protest the plan before us, protest the intention of um, pursue health. But I think the unintended consequence is if for some reason that this falls through, we have now opened up a, a process where the hurt of an unintended unknown hotel, unknown gas station is just allowed to continue through the remaining of the site. And to me, that seems it seems unacceptable. And so uh, with that, the PCD, true PCD, exclusive that rescinds the, if it's not built in an X amount of time. So then does that mean for three years this is a PCD and anything within a PCD can be proposed? Or does it mean this PCD site plan that is for this project is active for the period of time that's allowed by the applicant and then is rescinded? And is my question clear? That didn't sound very clear when I said it. Okay. No, it's, it's clear. Okay, perfect. Hopefully, <clears throat> hopefully my answer is just as clear. Okay. Uh, the exclusive PCD zone, um, th there's two items. If, you, if that is the way your commission is considering going, there's two ways to approach this. Uh, we could stop this zone change right now, and we could then come back with the actual PCD plan because when there's a PCD zone, you need to have a plan with that because you're approving a plan. So by saying we recommend a PCD zone to city council, there is no plan of approval for city council to approve. So it would really need to be referred back and we start the process over again. Uh, with that though, that approved plan is good for the three years. Let's just say at year two, the project's no good. Somebody can come back in with a revised PCD plan uh, and process a new PCD plan with a use that's permitted in the C2 zone or C1 or CO. And is the, the three years is, is, is codified, right? There's no leniency in, in shortening that term. If construction has not started, that is codified. If it had, yeah. construction has not started in three years, I'm I'm to report back as a planning director, report back to your commission. Okay. Is there any other commissioners like to speak in this matter or will, would, does somebody have a motion for us to consider or? Uh, commissioner Lomas would like to ask another question. No, we're gonna try another direction. All right. um, deed restrictions, what does that really mean? How much teeth is in that? Well, uh, Commissioner Lomas, if the applicant itself imposes the condition that he, he will only allow the transitional care facility, that will be recorded on the deed. And so it's a self-imposed condition and it's as good as, as anything that you, that you can imagine. I mean, it will restrict the land to only that, that use. Um, we can't impose that upon him, but if he chooses to, he can. And how what assurance do we have that it will be done? Because we can't impose it. Right. Yeah. Is that in perpetuity? What was the question? I'm sorry. What, what assurances can we get that this will be done? Well, it would be recorded against the, the property. No, I understand that, that we can't impose it tonight. So we, he would just say, yeah, I'll do it. It would be um, a condition that he would self-impose but it would not be, it would not be a condition on the zone change. Okay, but the language would still be in there. And yeah, can Larry, can he come back up? Yeah, absolutely. Come on, let's get up here and let's figure this out. It's the most expeditious way and cheapest yeah, way so of doing it. Yeah, so getting hit by the bus example, I don't, I don't, I'm not willing the attorneys would shoot me in the back of the room if they were here. I cannot, I cannot deed restrict to just that. That would be probably the dumbest thing I could ever do and the attorneys would tell me I would like to if I knew I was going to live forever but I would I'm willing to cross out any major concern items the gas station the adult um, things the, the 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 tire shop and I know it's a long exhaustive list but if you if there's a way that you could it's not that long um can can we take a break and can I have a pencil 
and a list of C2. You said can, you want can we get a list of C2? C1's fine. I don't. Is that something anything. you can help us with? Uh, is that something we can accomplish tonight? Yes. Okay. Yes. So let's go ahead and take that break for how long you need? What's 15 minutes? 20 minutes? What do we need? Yeah, I'd like you let's, guys to stick let's around. Let's do 20 minutes and then we'll see where we're at. Okay. You guys need to stick around. All right. Can Can I ask can one question? Yes, sir. Is it okay? So a keeping the same zoning with like a CUP overlay. That's not an option. I was never given that option, but. No conditional use permit on same zoning? It's not going to revert back to the CO zoning with the overlay, correct? You know what we can do and what may be appropriate? We can continue this um, for either to the next available meeting or to the December 3rd meeting, and that will allow us time to work out some of the details, and then we can come back. I vote that. <laughs> would the applicant, does that put you in a... <laughs> Is there like a, <laughs> if I could, I just look over on that, because we want to, we want to move forward, and it sounds like you guys like the project, um, so, and I'm, we bought the land feeling good about Gary and the community, so I want to, I'm going to move forward, um, but I just want, I want to, I don't know, you can't give that, but I, I want a general just consensus that you like the project, we'll work through it, and I want to get everyone moving. And we if could that, do this in two weeks. Okay. You, it, to, to get it all nailed down right and you're on the right page, they're on the right page. Sure. Come back in two weeks. Okay. No yeah? problem. No problem. Yeah, Let's, yeah. Uh, Commissioner Wade would like to. Uh, can we? Speak. Can you stay here? To the applicant. Just, I want to make sure you heard from everybody here. We want this project. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I mean, we can't, I know we're not going to legally bind ourselves to, to anything here, but. We want people from out of the community putting money into the community. The restaurants in the area are going to love this, this place being there. People visiting their family that's there. The hotel is going to love. Like, this is a good spot for that use. We love this project. Mm -hmm. So we, Bakersfield, we like to be the sort of community that welcomes people like you. So we're going to do everything we can within the boundaries of the law to make that happen. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, uh, is there a, do we need to make a motion to kick this to the next, uh, next meeting, Mr. Johnson? Can I ask one more question? Do you need sure. to see me at the next meeting or can I like be on the computer? <laughs> I mean, I, I enjoy coming up here, but <laughs> let me know that. Okay. <laughs> So, Mr. Johnson, is something that we, how do we go about doing that to kick it back to you guys and bring it to the next, uh, our next meeting? Uh, a motion could be made to continue this, I would suggest, for just two weeks um, and not, not wait till December 3rd. Um, this would probably be the only item on the agenda, but um, as long as we can have a commission, if, if they're here, we can come back in two weeks. Well, if it's an important enough issue, I think we can come, we can come for one issue, so... Yeah. The, the question I would ask is what is the commission expecting to happen during that time? Ms. Lomas, would you like to uh, hit that one? Are we able, ooh, here's a one I don't know. Um, are we able, are you able to reach out to the commissioners with the C2 list so that, or that the commissioners can email into you any concerns that they have to incorporate that into the list I know but we, they don't want us to do it tonight it's part of the municipal code so either we can provide a link and you can access it or we can email those sections so, those chapters it's up to you so everybody can access the list you have your concerns send it in to, to Paul yes if that's what you're directing yes we could do it like by Monday or something all commissioners can send it we, go, we don't want to delay them any further right yeah. perfect I like it you like it I like You're it. the chair. Do you want to make a motion to and do that? Then just so I'm clear, so we'll take that list of non-desirable uses and forward that to the applicant for their consideration and deed restricting from those uses? Yes. And oh, and I would love Mr. Simmons to, to be that. involved in this too. <laughs> Mr. Simmons, can we get Mr. Simmons to weigh in too? Yes. Mr. Simmons, are you it's available to in that process? 
it, it, this is a public process, so ob obviously we want the public to weigh in, and Mr. Simmons, I'm sure, knows where the muni code is. If not, we can also. Require a yes or no answer? Mm -hmm. Yes. We will be involved with you. Wonderful. All right, we have a team. All right, so would you like to make a motion? Oh, Mr. Ball, would you like to speak before we make Yeah, a just a quick thing. So. You know, this is kind of a, a probably not an appro uh, the right question, but is that list something we could have done tonight, or is that so exhaustive? I've gone through C2 before. It's really not... And it's not a very long list. I'm wondering if we could go back to the little 10 or 15 minute break and get it done right now. Let this gentleman get done. I'm available. I'd love to get it done. I know we have one more very important uh, issue. Commissioners, um, would we be able to table this item and move on to the, the rooming house? You want to get back to this at the end of the night? Yes. All right. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. Let's go ahead and do that. And uh, if you want to powwow with the, with the applicant and figure that out, that would be awesome. We'll come back to that. All right. So we're moving on now to item 6B. Director Johnson, would you like to read a staff report on item 6B? I would, yes, thank you. If you give me one moment. So, certainly. For those of you here that are here on item 6B, I want to assure you that you'll have ample opportunity to share your thoughts. We'll provide as much time as we need to, to hear all of you. So uh, thank you for your patience. Okay, well, let's go ahead and take a little break for maybe 10 minutes. Is that right? Your prerogative. Okay, five minutes. Five minutes, okay, thank you. Okay, so our five minutes is quickly becoming 10, so we can start to get back together. That'll be great. Chair Coleman? I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah. Yes, out yeah. of an abundance of caution, could you make a motion to reopen the public hearing? Because I think that when you did, it kind of was informal. Oh, okay. Uh, like so are we going to reopen the public hearing on item 6A, or are we going to open it on 6B? Are we going to continue with 6A? Or just in general? Yes. So for 6A, you're going to reopen it, and then you're going to table it for a date certain? We're going to table it for the end of the, of the meeting for today. Okay. So I'm going to make a motion to reopen item 6A and table item 6A until after item 6C, which it was 4B before, right? Okay. So we're going to reopen the public hearing on item 6A and pen to after item 6C. I, so do we need a vote on that or is that Yes, we need a vote. Okay, so we'll need a vote on that. So, uh, uh, Madam Clerk, can you please uh, fix this so we can vote? Thank you. I just made a motion. Do I need somebody to second it? Or can we just vote on it? I'll second the motion. Oh, okay. I have a motion that was for Mr. Uh, Bowers. So, can we uh, now move? have a vote, please? There you go. Thank you. Okay. Motion passes. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And do we need to now reopen uh, item 6B 
is where we started to uh, where we left off. Um, it was already open, Chair Coleman. Okay, so we're gonna re we're back on the record on item six B, and uh, we're looking for uh, the director staff report. Uh, thank you, Chair Coleman, commissioners, and I really thank the public for uh, showing out tonight. This is a public process, so we appreciate public input. I uh, also like to thank staff for the hard work that they put into this project. Uh, and there's a lot of research, a lot of documents that have been prepared. So item 6B is a request for a conditional use permit to allow a rooming house. The site is zoned R1, one family dwelling zone district, and located at 1421 Panorama Drive. The site is developed with a single family home as our properties to the south and west. Property to the north is open space and includes Panorama Park. Bakersfield College campus is located to the east. To provide background on permitted uses in the R1 zone, a homeowner can legally rent up to two rooms, one person in each room, within the primary residence. With re recent changes in state law, a homeowner can also construct a 1,200 square foot accessory dwelling unit and convert a 500 square foot portion of the primary home into a junior accessory dwelling unit, thereby renting to multiple individuals or families to provide additional income. Furthermore, our homeowner is legally allowed to operate a residential facility serving six or fewer persons if licensed by the state of California. City Council determined that a rooming house is a permitted use in the R1 zone subject to securing a conditional use permit. A rooming, her rooming house, as shown on the screen, is defined as a building containing three or more guest rooms used, designed, or intended to be used, let or hired to be occupied or which are occupied by three or more individuals with or without meals for compensation as permanent guests pursuant to a previous arrangement for compensation for definite periods by the month or greater term and in which rooms are not occupied by nor meals served to transients. As previously stated, the site is developed with an existing residence. The two-story, 3,652 square foot home contains seven bedrooms, a family room, a playroom, an office, a kitchen dining area. As proposed, Casa Esperanza Transitional Home for Women and Children, referred to as Casa Esperanza, will operate a rooming house as a residential housing program providing support for up to six homeless women and their minor children while transitioning to economic stability and permanent housing. According to the application, this will be a home where residents live in a family-like setting while acquiring the counseling and the job and life skills necessary for a sustainable transition to the job market and permanent housing. The application goes on to state that residents must be referred to the program and walk-ins are not permitted. Residents typically stay for 12 to 24 months, however, the stay may be longer depending on circumstances such as completion of an educational degree. Upon referral into the program, the resident will be required to sign the House Rules and Resident Agreement form acknowledging termination if they do not abide by the expectations of the program. The rules include, but are not limited to, limited to the following. Residents must develop a monthly budget and track all expenses and all income each month. At least 60% of the resident's income must be saved. Residents shall contribute 20% of income to the house each month as program fees to help meet operating expenses. Residents are responsible for the supervision of their children and must not leave children unattended. Children of school age must be enrolled and attending school on a regular basis. Vision, visitation hours are permitted 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. daily by appointment only. Curfew is 10 p.m. Sunday through Thursday and 12 a.m. midnight on Friday and Saturday. <clears throat> Smoking is prohibited on the premises. No lighted candles, incense burning, or open flames of any kind are permitted in the rooms. Drugs and alcohol are also prohibited on the premises. Should your commission approve the proposed request, staff is recommending op the operational rules, regulations, and eligibility criteria for the project be adopted as conditions of approval. If approved, the applicant is proposing improvements that will consist of cosmetic enhancements to the exterior while maintaining the character of the home. Fencing will be installed, old driveways will be removed, sidewalks will be constructed along Panorama Drive and Haley Street, and enhanced landscaping will be added. The applicant will be required to submit for building permits to facilitate the remodel of the home. It is through this process that improvements will be required to address any outstanding code violations or unpermitted conversions that may have occurred on site. 
As part of their neighborhood outreach, Casa Esperanza conducted two meetings. This was accomplished via Zoom due to COVID. Signs were placed on site notifying the public of this meeting as well as mailings to owners within 300 feet and publication in the local newspaper. In response, staff, re staff received two comments and 244 form letters in support of the project. Staff also received 17 letters and a petition with 100 signatures in opposition to the project. Those responses are attached to the staff report and summarized on pages 7 through 10 of the same report. Also provided for your commission's consideration are comments that were submitted subsequent to preparation of the staff report. The 94 pages contain one comment in opposition and the remainder in support. Those were provided to your commission as part of the director's memorandum dated November 5th. Additionally, per the agenda that allows the public to make comment via telephone calls, staff accepted a call from Christy Coons, who is in favor of the project. Ms. Coons noted that she is on two housing programs with the Housing Authority of Kern, and the Casa, Casa Esperanza project is well thought out and will provide education, mentoring, and attacks the multi-generational problem. She also noted to staff that the location is ideal for training and perhaps a partnership with Bakersfield College. The ordinance contains specific findings that must be made in order for your commission to approve the requested conditional use permit. Those two findings are, number one, the proposed use is deemed essential or desirable to the public convenience or welfare, and number two, the proposed use is in harmony with the various elements and objectives of the general plan or applicable specific plans. The ordinance also states that a conditional use permit may be subject to conditions as deemed necessary to assure compliance with intent and purpose of the zoning regulations and the various elements and objectives of the general plan and policies of the city or to protect the public health, safety, convenience, or welfare. After considering information presented in the record, public testimony, and deliberations, your commission could make a motion on one of the following options. You may approve the project. In doing so, your commission could approve the project subject to applicable conditions of approval. You could deny the project. Your commission could deny the project for specific reasons determined and made known by your commission. You can continue the project to a later date. If you have unanswered questions and or the request and or you request additional information unavailable at the time of this hearing and it is needed in order for you to make an informed decision, your commission can, could continue the hearing to a date certain to provide that additional time to attain the information or your commission could refer the project back to staff if you have substantial concerns that require an undetermined amount of time to resolve, in which case it may warrant that the project be referred back to staff for re-advertisement and reconsideration at a later date. Based on available information, staff believes both findings can be made as outlined on pages 10 through 12 of the staff report and therefore recommend approval of the conditional use permit number 20-0179. Should your commission concur, staff is recommending 10 pages of conditions of approval included as attachment A to the resolution. And this completes staff's presentation. Thank you, Director Johnson. Uh, the public hearing on this item is now open. Uh, by a show of hands, uh, how many here are speaking in favor, are planning to speak in favor of this project? And then uh, how many people in opposition? Okay. Uh, let me just, uh, I'm sorry, let me just review how this is gonna work so you all have an opportunity to speak. Uh, first, those in favor of the project will be allowed to speak. Those in opposition to the project will be able to speak after all those in favor have spoken. Each side will be given five minutes to provide rebuttal comments Individual speakers may ask questions during their statements, but the questions will not be answered until the public hearing on that item is closed. Written comments may be given to the clerk who will provide copies to the commission. Please be respectful of others participating in the hearing by not repeating the remarks of previous speakers and presenting any new comments or thoughts in a concise and clear way. So at this time, at this time, uh, is there anyone in, who would like to speak in favor of the project? Please come to the microphone and uh, state your name and begin.
Good evening, commissioners, staff, Madam Clerk, and the good people of Bakersfield. My name is Jim Mosier, spelled M-O-S-H-E-R, and I am the secretary of Casa Esperanza Transitional Home for Women and Children here in Bakersfield. I'm here tonight to speak in support of approval of the CUP, and my specific request is that this commission approve it tonight. Casa Esperanza represents a new possibility for Bakersfield, a possibility for addressing homelessness, but it's also a possibility of hope for homeless and mothers. And excuse children. me, if you could move that microphone closer to your face, that would be great so we can all hear you. Sure. Casa Esperanza represents a new possibility for Bakersfield. It's a possibility for addressing the issues of homelessness. It's also a possibility of hope for homeless mothers and children hope that there's a different future available to them and that there are people in this community that are willing to work with them and are committed to them achieving that new future. It's also a possibility for partnership amongst all stakeholders. And when you think about it truly, we are all stakeholders in homelessness and addressing it and in the outcomes that we achieve. Casa Esperanza is transitional housing. It is a home coupled with a structured program, and it represents the possibility of breaking the intergenerational cycle of poverty and homelessness. That's where we stand. That's the future we're standing in. Casa Esperanza is the right project, at the right location, and now is the time. For the next 18 minutes, I'll be giving an overview of Casa Esperanza, and I will be followed by two of my board members who will be speaking to the specific facts, the objective facts, and they'll also be using those facts to dispel some myths that have been circulating publicly about Casa Esperanza. Please know we are com committed to transparency and we are here and want to address every one of your concerns and questions. I'm going to speak to three areas tonight. Number one, what Casa Esperanza is. Two, what it is not, and three, why it is the right project at the right location at the right time and worthy of approval of the CUP. What is Casa Esperanza? First and foremost, it is a home. It is a home, an environment of peace and non-judgment where homeless mothers and their children can obtain the stability of living in a family-like environment while they reconstitute their lives and reintegrate into the society. The goal in every respect is that the home will honor the inherent dignity of each individual, the staff of the home, and the surrounding neighborhood, both in character and in operation. The women of the home living in the at Casa Esperanza are required in turn to dignify that home as a place of respect, warmth, and acceptance for all who live in the home and everyone in the community. Behavior that does not honor that inherent dignity and maintain that environment simply won't be tolerated. In fact, it's grounds for termination from the program. So Casa Esperanza first and foremost is a home Second, Casa Esperanza is a structured program, a program designed to empower homeless women to invent a new narrative for their lives and the lives of their children. New futures that may seem implausible to them at the outset, but may in fact be reachable if they obtain the necessary job skills, parenting skills, and education that they need to succeed in the workplace. Skills that will enable them and their children to reintegrate into permanent housing and society at large. Each woman at Casa Esperanza will develop her own unique life plan that fulfills on what she is committed to, to achieving for herself and her family. Some women may arrive at Casa Esperanza already with a fairly complete toolkit and they only need to spend a few months there in order to get skills to get back on their feet after losing employment after losing housing or perhaps even losing a spouse. Others may be starting with a relatively empty toolbox. It may require extensive training to close gaps in their education, in their job skills, and they'll need additional time. We anticipate the stay, length of stay for a woman at Casa Esperanza is going to be between 12 and 24 months, less for some, 
and probably more for a few others. The program is flexible in its structure and it allows the house staff, the program manager, to tailor the woman's program to her needs and the needs of her children. However, regardless of the length of stay and the uniqueness of those needs, the woman must agree to abide by the house rules, else they risk being terminated from the program. So I want to emphasize this house rules are the key to the integrity and the workability of our program. Without rules, nothing works. And for that reason, we're fully supportive of staff's recommendation to incorporate many of the house rules as conditions for approval in the CUP. And those conditions for approval constitute our license to operate without which there is no Casa Esperanza. So we take that extremely seriously. What are these rules? As was mentioned by Director Johnson, uh, they can be found in detail as an attachment to the resolution, attachment A. Here are some of them. One, the woman will be working, actively looking for work, closing gaps in their job skills, closing gaps in her education, or perhaps all of the above. Their children will be enrolled in school, they will faithfully attend school, and the women will ensure that they are safely transported to and from school. The women are solely responsible for the supervision of their own children. And the women will take turn doing household chores, cooking for everyone, cleaning. They'll participate in individual counseling and group counseling in accordance with their program. And they'll participate in financial stewardship training to ensure that they develop a budget, they're accountable for that budget, and that as Director Johnson mentioned, they'll contribute 20% of their income to the house and they will save the rest for when they transition out of Casa Esperanza into permanent housing. So there's a rainy day fund to pay the rent, to pay the security deposit, and to fix the truck when the water pump goes out so they don't fall back into homelessness. Smoking drugs, alcohol, open flames are all prohibited and as was mentioned, the women will abide by a curfew. In short, the program and its rules demand a lot from these women, but it also demands a lot from us as sponsors and developers of Casa Esperanza. We want to be held accountable to keeping our word and our promises to you, because without that level of integrity and accountability, nothing works. The women will have the foremost role in ensuring that the house rules are enforced, but staff will be there in a parallel role, overarching, always ensuring that if what the women are, are doing is not effective, they're going to step in. Mandatory weekly house meetings ensure that what's working and what's not with the house rules is discussed, any issues are surfaced and they're dealt with. Should house staff or residents believe the rules are not being followed or enforced, or enforced fairly, then they can appeal directly to the chair of the board of directors. The same is true in the event the house staff recommends terminating a woman from the program. We do have an appeal process, a grievance process to ensure fairness and equity. However, based on the experience of Alexandria House in Koreatown in Los Angeles, the Oakland Elizabeth House up north, and the Jesus Mary and Joseph House in Santa Cruz, California, we believe that termination from the program is going to be extremely rare. In the 23 years that Alexandria House has been in operation, they have only terminated two women at the same time because they could not get along with each other, so they were both asked to leave. That's less than 1% of the 200 women and families that have transitioned through Alexandria House. I talked a lot about the women being held to account. Staff is also held to account, not only for following and enforcing the rules, but providing the leadership and the management that they promise to deliver and bring to their role at Casa Esperanza. Annual staff performance reviews will be conducted by a select committee of the board of directors. And in addition, several board members will meet on site with the residents several times a year without staff to get candid feedback that might otherwise not be heard. 
We're in the final stages of drafting detailed job descriptions for the staff positions, and we've engaged an employment law attorney to prepare our employee handbook and to re review all of our documentation after the CUP process has run its course. So that's the structured program. Casa Esmeralda is a home. It's a, a structured program. And I want to add that all neighbors and stakeholders will also have the ability to file a complaint, a concern, or any question with the staff at the house. And if they're not satisfied, they can upline it to the chair of the board of directors. I'd now like to speak briefly about what Casa Esperanza is not. It is not a short-term or long-term shelter. It's transitional housing coupled with a program. It's not a drug and alcohol rehab facility. The women must be clean and sober at least a year before they're even considered. It's not a safe house for women actively fleeing domestic violence. That chapter in their lives has to be closed before they come to Casa Esperanza. It's not a residential care facility licensed by the state, and it's not a long-term facility for people with disabilities. Finally, Casa Esperanza is not a faith-based program. We have no religious requirement for participation. But there's many big, uh, organizations and facilities here in Bakersfield currently providing those services, and we will partner with them and work with them wherever we can. Casa Esperanza and its mission are unique. We're providing a home, a structured program, and it's all aimed at breaking this intergenerational cycle of homelessness and poverty. We'll do it in a family-like home setting, structured program, and clear and demanding rules. Bakersfield does not have a Casa Esperanza program, and we say that, Cas that Bakersfield needs a Casa Esperanza program. So lastly, I'd like to speak about why Casa Esperanza is the right project at the right location in the time is now. Homelessness has no season, it has no boundaries, and no community is immune from its presence and its impacts. But Bakersfield's a perfect setting for Casa Esperanza. And why is that? And that's because Bakersfield likes to lead. Bakersfield crafts pragmatic solutions, not utopian policies and programs. And Casa Esperanza is a pragmatic, common sense program. We're complementary, filling a niche in the universe of homelessness services that are provided. We're not additive. Excuse me, we are additive. We're not duplicative. And we're providing more beds and housing, which frees up other sources, resources in the community. We couple rights with responsibilities. It's a privilege to be at Casa Esperanza. It's not an entitlement. And we provide a hand up, not a hand out. Our goal is to honor and dignify each individual and in their right to self-determination. They get to say what their future is going to be. We're out to make the intergenerational change, and we're committed to sustainability. We're setting the illustrious goal of 100% retention in permanent housing. As you may have read in the report or elsewhere, Alexandria House has north of 90% retention after 23 years. We're, we're going for the big numbers. And lastly, we're going to be tracking outcomes, collecting hard data over the years and the decades. This is something that's sadly missing from a lot of well-designed, well-intentioned programs, but the data is not there to show the impact and the effectiveness over the years. We're going to be collecting data, especially on the children, school attendance, graduation rates, college and vocational achievements, employment outcomes, run-ins with the law, retention in permanent housing. We're committed to continuously observing and measuring our impact, and we're going to do more of what works, and we're going to do less of what doesn't seem to be effective. Why 1421 Panorama Drive? Well, quite simply, it is the ideal location for Casa Esperanza. It's transportation connected. It's a five-minute walk, less than a quarter mile, to the Get Bus bus hub at BC, where six bus lines take these women to childcare, to work, to job skills training, and further education. It's a safe neighborhood. 
and the home is sufficiently sized with its seven bedrooms and four bathrooms. Luckily, there's no pool that we will need to fill in, and it has a large backyard for the kids to play in, over half an acre lot. It's in close proximity to schools and to childcare options, and there's no need for on-street parking. All of the parking is interior to the lot, and it is screened from public view. There's minimal adjacency, one common property line, and it's close to open space and recreational areas on the bluffs. Just as important, this home, Casa Esperanza, supports two of the Bakersfield City Council's overarching goals set for 2019 and 2020. The first is goal number two, to address homelessness, and specifically it's activity 2.1B, which aims to increase transitional housing development and provide more options and increasing capacity to address homelessness here in Bakersfield. Casa Esperanza does this. It also supports goal number eight, urban renewal, which is aimed at revitalizing established areas of the city which are not eligible for federal funding. And so one of staff's conditions of approval requires us to install, install ADA compliant ramps and sidewalks on Haley and Panorama. And there's existing crosswalks there, but they don't connect to anything. And so we think this is gonna be a really well appreciated benefit to BC students and to people living in the area in visiting the area. Lastly, and I do know that I'm preaching to the choir here, we have a housing availability crisis. We have a housing affordability crisis. And we have a homelessness crisis. And they're all intertwined. So each day that we delay establishing Casa Esperanza is a missed opportunity to provide hope and a new future for our homeless mothers and their children. That's why the time is now. Time is of the essence. Time looks to be of the essence into the foreseeable future. And so what I want to leave you with is this. It is the right project. It is at the right location. And now is the time. We don't have the answer to homelessness, but we know that Casa Esperanza is part of the solution. Casa Esperanza appropriately balances individual rights with the public welfare and the well-being of the community. And that is the express goal of this commission. We give our promise, our word, that Casa Esperanza will operate with integrity, accountability, and transparency. That's the only way we will be successful, and that is our license to operate. So my request of this commission is that you approve the CUP as recommended by planning staff. I thank you for your generous attention and listening, and I'll field any questions if it's appropriate. If not, I will turn the microphone over to two of my fellow board members who have some things to say. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker, please, in favor. Please state your name and continue. Thank you. My name is Julie Caesar, and I'm the chairman of Casa Esperanza Transitional Home for Women and Children. Thank you very much for your time tonight. I do want to say that I think we had, by the end, we had over 300 letters of support, and we're not going to have a ton of speaking, people speaking today because we really want to respect your time. We're trying to just say our, our things one time. Um, you know, we understand the concern of the neighbors. Everybody's concerned about their neighborhood. And we think a lot of that stems from the fear of the unknown. And so that's why we've kind of reached out to them. We want them to understand what our program is about and how we will be a great neighbor, not just a good neighbor, a great neighbor. And a lot of the reasons, uh, we have a lot of reasons we think we'll be a great neighbor. Probably one of the most important is we're going to be investing about $100,000 in this property. Um, this is a home that does need some tender, loving care. We're going to invest. It's going to look like one of the best homes on the block. And that will be really good for all of the neighbors. That will um, increase the value of their homes. Um, this house can handle many residents. 
Um, it was a foster care home, which is why it has a bunch of bedrooms and whatnot for quite a while. It hasn't been for a little bit. But the present owner states that there's been about 16 people living there. Um, and there has been no complaints or anything from the neighbors. It's kind of hard to know how many people are living there because the way it's situated on the lot, it's a large lot. There's really only one block wall with a neighbor and it leads to some privacy between the home and the neighbors and whatnot. Um, we are largely modeled after Alexandria House down in Los Angeles. That is kind of in a multi-use area. Um, but they've had really no issues with their neighbors, and it's because they've had good open communication with them. Also, there is the Oakland Elizabeth House in Oakland. They actually are on a church property, but they have single family homes around them, and they've had no issues with their neighbors. They said that was due to, you know, their communication, letting their neighbors know what they're doing and about their program. There's the Jesus, Mary, and Joseph House that we've also worked with. Um, they are in Santa Cruz. They're probably closer to size than us. Um, they are in a, a neighborhood that has other single family homes around it, and they have had no issues. Um, I can quote Pat Gordon. She's their program manager. She said, um, they know who we are, and they appreciate that we are here. Some neighbors have expressed a concern um, that they think that we're not going to succeed. Well, I have all the confidence in the world. We put a lot of time and money and effort into this project that we are going to proceed. We're going to have very well-trained staff, a program manager with a master's degree and experience. We're going to have people, um, a, a staff person on the property at all times. We are going to succeed. And I know you guys know this, but I think it's important to state that um, the conditional use permit has so many parameters in it. If anything happened and the house was to be sold, it the conditional use permit would not apply because of all the parameters. They would have to be Casa Esperanza in order to use our conditional use permit. So Casa Esperanza is great for Bakersfield, and I don't think anybody is saying that it's not. The neighbors said, we think that's a wonderful program, and we do. It's a matter of, well, where do we, where do we go? It is very important to our program that we're in a neighborhood. It's how we've established this program that it will be in a neighborhood. And Bakersfield does not have a lot of mixed use areas with large houses, with large lots. We've done the looking. We think this, this one is ideal. Um, Jim pointed out a few of those um, points. Uh, so briefly, I will just say, as far as parking goes, we have parking in the backyard, out of view. We do not need to reside um, to um, have any parking on the street. Also, we're right across from BC. Um, we are going to be collaborating with them quite a bit. They have so many programs. Uh, higher up would be one that we've already talked to them about. So that will be important. We've got the transportation, um, which is right there, very close. Um, all of these things. I just know that we are going to be a great neighbor in a great neighborhood. I would ask that you would um, grant our conditional use permit tonight um, so that we can get on with helping these women and children with the key being that we can make permanent change in their lives, we really want to be given that opportunity. Thank you very much. And Bonita Steele is going to speak next. Thank you. The next speaker, please. Please come to the microphone and state your name. Are there any other speakers in favor of this project? Maybe if you try to move up a little closer so we can keep it moving. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners, staff. Uh, my name is Bonita Steele, S-T-E-E-L-E, -E -E, and I'm a board member of Casa Esperanza Transitional Home for Women and Children. I'm speaking in support and request your approval of the conditional use permit and related conditions as recommended by staff. Tonight, I'm going to be addressing several myths and what I view as misunderstandings that seem to have arisen around the project in three different areas around the number of persons, supervision, rules and household management, and safety and security. I, before I address those myths and misunderstandings, I do want to let you know that I've, over the last 
two decades, I have personally had experience with different housing projects that involve people with disabilities in both an apartment setting and a licensed board and care facility. This will be neither of those models, but I do understand and have provided some um, guidance and have assisted the board in looking at subject matter experts to ensure that this program really is of the highest caliber and will support the women and be a good neighbor. So the first area of myth and misunderstanding has to do with the number of people in the home. And I want to just mention that staff indicate that approving the CUP is not a precedent. And I, I know I don't need to tell you all that. You, you already know that. But that, that seems to be a concern of the neighbors. Zoning ordinances obviously cannot be disregarded by any future owner. The second myth is that the number of occupants will be unsafe. But that's not true. The city building and fire prevention department have the authority to determine according to what is defined by the maximum occupancy standard according to the housing building and fire codes as to what is safe. And we will certainly abide by that. You also heard Jim and Julie address the prior use of a foster home and how many folks were there for several years. I, want, I believe it was 10 or 15 years. And the neighbors didn't seem to be aware of that. They thought there was only three or four people in the home. And so I think that is due to the site, siting of the project and the fact that there is only one bordering wall, that adjacency may well contribute to that. But regardless, we'll abide by the decision of how many people are safe to occupy the building. The third myth is, well, um, regardless, is there, does the occupancy pose a fire risk? On the contrary, I would say more eyes in the home ensures that fire risk is eliminated or reduced to the same level of risk that's present in any home in any neighborhood in Bakersfield. In addition, we'll be installing an automatic fire sprinkler system, which would reduce any unacceptable fire risk. Now I'd like to move to the area of supervision, rules, and household management. The first myth is that the policies and rules will be difficult to enforce and just won't be followed. Nope. Any tenant who violates a house rule or the resident agreement purely and simply will be terminated. Casa Esperanza agrees and accepts staff's proposed CUP conditions which require continuous adherence to the operating statement, house rules, and resident agreement. And any tenant violating that will be terminated. Staff recommends and Casa Esperanza agrees to have staff on site 24 hours a day, seven days per week. We agree and accept that the CUP can be revoked at any time with good cause if any element of the CUP conditions are not continuously met. We accept these terms. We will enforce all of the rules as recommended by staff and as contained in the submission to the commission. The second myth is that staff will be untrained or will not be able to manage the household. And while Jim and Julie did touch on this point, I would like to go a little bit more deeply into this subject. We will be hiring multiple staff members. They will all have the appropriate education, training, and experience for their positions. There will be sufficient staff to ensure 24-7 coverage, even when staff are unavail unable to work due to illness, vacation, or time off. The, as Jim mentioned, the job descriptions uh, for the staff are in the process of being reviewed and validated both by subject matter experts, people who are operating these kinds of residences, as well as our attorney, to ensure that job qualifications 
education, and experience are appropriate for each position and that we are, that we are offering an appropriate and competitive salary and that the staffing structure provides appropriate staff coverage. Again, we agree with staff's recommendations and we accept the conditions that staff has proposed related to staffing. We will have excellent staff who will engage with the women, who will counsel, and who will support them in achieving what is in their what is in their own individual plan and the women will be expected to make progress on those plans that's clearly stated in the resident agreement now i'd like to address the third item safety and security the first myth is that the project poses privacy safety and security issues for existing families in the neighborhood and I want to also bring in a couple of other unrelated myths. Well, they're, they're related. They were brought up during, during some of our engagement with the residents in that neighborhood. They left us with the impression that they believe these are undesirable people, that they're not worthy of living in their neighborhood. Maybe they're from out of the area. Or maybe the women know undesirable people who would threaten the safety and security of the neighborhood. Let me unpack this. Let me start with the people. As Jim mentioned, we will only be accepting referrals. You can't just walk up to Casa Esperanza and get in. You have to have referrals. You will go through a vetting process. There will be multiple interviews. And then the person, if they're accepted, still has to agree to all of those rules. This is not for the person who's not serious about changing their life. The person who's not serious about changing their life, they're gonna go to the shelter, or they're gonna go sleep on their friend's couch. They're not gonna come to Casa Esperanza. Just those women who are committed to this program and to changing their lives, they will be interested in Casa Esperanza. And now let me address um, you know, the fact of where are they coming from? Well, they will be from the Bakersfield area. Unfortunately, as Jim mentioned, we have more than enough homeless women and children in the Bakersfield area that are in need of this program. And now let me address their visitors. Casa Esperanza residents and visitors are required to follow the house rules. As Jim mentioned, they'll only be able to visit from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., and their visits are restricted to common areas of the home. Visitors will be barred from visiting if they violate the house rules. Residents who are unable to follow the house rules, including those related to visitors, will be terminated from the program. Let me move on to privacy. Staff has recommended and Casa Esperanza agrees to the enhanced landscaping plan that will provide additional privacy and act as a buffer between the proposed site and the adjacent neighbors. We believe this will provide the additional privacy that the neighbors prefer. Let me now address safety and security. In the two meetings that we had with neighbors, they shared with us that they are ex currently experiencing some safety and security issues in their neighborhood. They talked about a window being shot out by a BB gun. They talked about people peeing in the alley. They talked about couches and other trash and debris being left in the neighborhood. Given the very strict rules of Casa Esperanza, we do not believe that the women and children living at the home will contribute to the existing neighborhood challenges. In fact, Casa Esperanza will engage with the neighborhood to clean up and address ad existing trash in the alley, and we will participate in any other community projects so that we can support and make the environment safer, cleaner, and more secure for everyone. Casa Esperanza staff and residents will participate in Neighborhood Watch, 
or we will or and we will report to the appropriate authorities any unacceptable behavior by people entering the neighborhood since we are on the edge of the neighborhood that allows us to provide that assistance so if there is anyone coming into the neighborhood and behaving in an unacceptable way, engaging in vagrancy or other illegal or unacceptable behavior, we will report that. We will support the safety of this neighborhood. Casa Esperanza's interests are aligned with the neighbors and we will support and improve the safety and security of this neighborhood. Now I'd like to address the last myth that somehow the children will not be safe. We will do everything we possibly can to ensure the safety of the children living at Casa Esperanza. We will make sure that there is property fencing to ensure that no child is able to access Panorama or Haley. All children living at the property will be allowed to play in the fenced backyard play area only. As was described, it is a large area. Like all children, and as Jim mentioned, the children will be in school, whether it's remote, if we're still in COVID, <laughs> or, or if it's in person, they will be in school. At no time, and this is the most important part, at all times the children will be supervised by their mothers, both inside or outside the home. At no time will the children be unsupervised. They will not be wandering the streets. That would be a violation of the house rules and the resident agreement, and they would be terminated from the program if that behavior occurred. Again, we believe that we can create a safe environment that does not encroach upon any neighbor's privacy, safety, or security. And at the same time, we believe we can contribute to the safety of the neighborhood and ensure the safety of the children living in the home. And finally, we agree and accept the consequences. We agree and accept to all of staff's recommended conditions that they will all be continuously adhered to. In closing, I'd like to just say that as a board member, we have been listening to and we have heard, and we will continue to be responsive to all fact-based concerns. We're prepared, as Jim said, to act with integrity and transparency in addressing any concerns, and we welcome being held accountable for maintaining continuous compliance with staff CUP recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker in favor. Jim Mosier again on behalf of Casa Esperanza. If Casa Esperanza is a worthy program, 1421 Panorama is the ideal site. For all of the reasons that you heard, Casa Esperanza works at that site. And it is the integrity of the program, the integrity of the site, the integrity of the operation that is the license to operate. And that is based on the rules and enforcement of the rules. And those are, to the high degree, hardwired into the conditions for approval of the conditional use permit. So we fully accept and actually appreciate staff really holding us to account because it's a big game that we're playing. And we're not willing to jeopardize a license to operate. The women and the children who need our help are too important. So thank you for your kind consideration. And again, I'll reiterate, our recommendation is that tonight you approve the conditional use permit for Casa Esperanza. Thank you. Thank you. There's no other uh, speakers in favor. We'll now begin uh, people in opposition. So uh, anybody like to speak, please come to the microphone, state your name, and begin. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for taking this CUP application under careful consideration tonight. 
Uh, my name is Kristen Yurkides. I live at 1411 Panorama Drive, which is the house directly um, next to um, the applicant site. I share about 232 feet of fence line. Um, we've done a lot of research in the last six months or so and learned a lot about municipal codes and zoning, much more than I ever imagined I would. Um, but I'd like to share a few thoughts with you about um, what I've learned. Um, we do not oppose helping homeless women and their ch uh, children transitioning out of homelessness. Rather, we oppose the plan that is presented to you today that requires a conditional use permit in order to operate. From our vantage point in knowing this neighborhood, we find several major flaws and deficiencies in Casa Esperanza's plans. After coordinating two meetings and speaking with board members, there are too many unresolved issues and neighborhood concerns that are not being addressed. Um, I actually requested and coordinated both of those meetings um, in, in an effort to kind of reach out. I'm a little bit envious of the last project we heard where there was um, a lot more conversation going on and a lot of uh, listening and kind of response. Um, we definitely have been listened to. I don't feel there's been a response or a change in any of the concerns um, that, we've, that we've raised. Um, but anyway, after coordinating these meetings and speaking with board members with several neighbors um, over Zoom, um, there are too many unresolved issues and neighborhood concerns that are not being addressed. They are deviating from the implementation strategies of several established transitional homes they have identified as models and making their own path. In our minds, a poorly executed plan will help no one. There are several reasons why I, along with my neighbors, oppose this project. First, many of our concerns relate to the fact that Casa Esperanza wants to fill the single family home with too many people. They are proposing that six families live in the single family home with only one live in residential assistant. Um, that would be there full time. Um, I brought some visuals. Um, this is uh, figure one of the 2020 uh, Kern. The Bakersfield Kern Regional Homeless Collaborative 2020 pit count, um, a point in time, it was January of uh, this year. Um, and from the um, adults with children, which I spoke with someone at the collaborative, um, asked them about how many of those would be male versus female. She said overwhelmingly, um, it, it's mainly females. And then the number of children. And so currently sheltered at that point in time, um, there were 64 adults with children and 126 children. So it's about a one to two ratio of, uh, you know, for every uh, adult with children, they have roughly two children. Um, so by that accounts, the, the women that would be coming in would bring in two dependent children on average. Um, thus, it's a log logical assumption that one woman would reside in the home, would have an average of two dependent children, Hence, we estimate that Casa Esperanza will likely operate with six women and 12 or more children, along with one residential assistant, bringing the occupancy of the home to 19 or more. And there is no cap to the total number of occupants who can live here other than, like what was mentioned earlier, under the fire code, which if you're in a, um, you know, a meeting room or something, there's a maximum occupancy of how many you could kind of shuttle in the room. It's not really a livable, um, occupancy max. It's just for fire safety. Um, so other than that, there would be no cap to the number of individuals that could reside in the home. Um, so loose estimates, 19 or 20 would be um, it, there um, at full occupancy um, in their minds. This is far above what the average occupancy and it is in a single family home and is completely unrealistic jump from the R1 approved zoning for this neighborhood, which is all single family homes. Um, there are other conditional use permits in the neighborhood, but they are not for transitional homes. They're for like, I'm going to do this to my fence, or I'm going to do, it's, it's different uses. This is a transitional use home that's essentially bringing in a business to operate instead of a family. Um, and these homes have been there since the 50s. They've been single family homes. When asked if the project could operate with fewer than six women, we were told that that was not possible. Please do not ignore the actual logistics of what it would take to make this plan work with family dinners, multiple families sharing small bathrooms, and multiple ages of dependent children living under one roof. 
This floor plan is not usable for 20 people to live in safely. And I, I know there was a visual up earlier. This is, this is their um, proposed. Um, it's not too different than the one that was in the original application. Um, currently, there's a couple of garage conversions that are not permitted. Um, so the original structure of the house was basically this part here to the dining room with, um, I believe, the second story. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on in these additions that is a bit confusing. Um, and I'm not really sure why they're sticking with this format if they have the ability to come in and um, do some work, do some upgrades and things. Second, I'm not convinced that this project even qualifies for a CUP when there is no specific wording in Casa Esperanza's operating statement that the women and children that live here are required to be living in Bakersfield before residing at Casa Esperanza. Jim Mosher, board secretary, confirmed this in a recent Bakersfield, Californian article. Mosher acknowledged there is no explicit barring of women and their children from outside of Bakersfield. What is to prevent them from serving as an overflow facility for other transitional homes they are partnering with, like the Alexandria House in LA? This does not serve the city of Bakersfield as an essential or desirable for the public convenience and welfare, as is required for a CUP, if their residents are not coming from our own city. Vague wording is not sufficient or acceptable. Third, when I coordinated two meetings between neighbors and Casa Esperanza board members, they gave us the name of, a transitional, uh, of transitional homes that they had studied and planned to model their startup project after. However, there are several significant differences between what they are proposing and how their successful models run. The Alexandria House is the main model transitional home that Casa Esperanza have referenced in their literature and advertising and is located on South Alexandria Avenue in Los Angeles in a multiple family residential zoned area. It's flanked on all sides by apartment complexes. I actually have two pictures for you. I'm not sure if this made it in your packet, um, so I'll just kind of pop them up here. Um, so Alexandria House is actually two homes next to each other. Um, the green one was my understanding the original home and then I guess they had the opportunity to uh, expand it to the house next door. So as you can see there, um, they are homes. Uh, they're in a multifamily residential area and if you look at the sides of the pictures, there are apartment buildings on either side as well as behind. So this is very different than the proposed type of location that they're picking for the project here in Bakersfield. And again, I have concerns deviating from a successful model. You're not really sure how that's going to work out. This is my last visual. <laughs> um, this is a, a bit of the zoning map in LA where the Alexandria House is located. It's uh, this little blue outline right here. All the rest of this orange is also multifamily use. The reddish pink salmon type color is commercial use. Um, so again, it's vastly different in the location, the type of zoning, the other types of um, buildings that are around. So again, lots of concerns with deviating from a model that's proven very successful for Alexandria House. Um, in the Google Map snapshots, which you see here in front of you, I counted no less than 12 vehicles parked in the driveways and immediately adjacent to the property. So this is just a random point in time when Google car passed by the street. Um, but I, I think the assumption that these women are not going to have their own vehicles is a very big assumption. Um, offering limited parking um, is a step in the right direction, especially in our, our neighborhood with um, you know, impact from the BC parking and, and whatnot, um, that's appreciated. I don't know if it's gonna be enough to prevent them from needing some on-street parking at some point. Another example of how Casa Esperanza has deviated substantially from their model is in the oversight of operations. The woman who started the Alexandria House, Sister Judy Vaughn, lives in the home with these women. She's able to develop rapport and deep connections with the residents because she is physically present. We asked Casa Esperanza board members if any of them would be living in the house and were told no. As an aside, you should know that the Alexandria House experienced an accidental fire in March of 2020, earlier this year. There's house rule about flames and candles not being allowed in the bedrooms, but it doesn't appear to be a rule about um, minimizing fire hazards in the common areas like the kitchen. Um, installing fire sprinklers 
are, is not going to erase the increased fire risk from so many occupants in a single home. Again, we, we ask you to think about the logistics of this proposal. Plans look fine on paper, but implementation is another story. Fourth, as a high school science teacher, I have firsthand experience that managing a group of people successfully with different backgrounds, needs, and expectations is not something that a person masters overnight. Casa Esperanza proposes that only one person would reside in the home as a residential assistant. The other staff members would be there during some type of business hours, um, but that run, one residential assistant would be there full time. When asked what the qualifications would be in this person, they did not have a clear answer. We assume it would m most likely be a young person who is obviously interested in helping their community, but will likely lack the skills and knowledge required to maintain peace, order, and ensure all posted rules are followed by residents at all times. This is unacceptable that any issues that arise from this project will not have the appropriate supervision and insight with which to manage them. Because Casa Esperanza has not planned for any security personnel, neighbor, neighbors will have to call for public assistance by way of police, fire, or EMT when issues come up that are not resolved by the staff. A multi-generational home knows with some degree of certainty that all family members are likely to be able to cohabitate with each other. When you throw six families together who don't know one another, there will be no guarantee that they will be able to cohabitate peacefully. There will be no guarantee that any invited or uninvited guests will follow the rules either. Finally, aside from being worried that the implementation plan for this project is far from perfect, I worry that this project, if approved, will turn the street corner permanently into a business rather than a residential home. A parking lot is being proposed for the rear yard, taking up about half of that large lot, that rear yard. Um, half of it would be a parking lot, with, I'm assuming they would stripe it, um, at least to be paved. Um, and then the other half would be the children's play area, which for, like I mentioned earlier, possibly 12 children is maybe a little bit small for that number of children. If it was two or three children, great, they've got a big grassy area. It's not its own park. Um, that could accommodate that many children playing outside at once. We have been told that the three staff members plus other individuals will come to the house to provide services to the residents. This will not look or feel like a home anymore, but rather a place of business. We do not want or need another issue to monitor in order to maintain a safe and secure atmosphere for our families. I understand their mission and get what they are trying to do, but there are too many unfilled holes in their plan. Therefore, we have no choice but to ask that the Planning Commission reject this application and suggest that Casa Esperanza go back to the drawing board in order to draft a more reasonable and realistic plan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Good evening. I'm Kristen's husband. I live directly, walls directly towards with the house. Uh, my, more of my concerns are with the safety of the children at, that they're proposing to live in this house. Sir, can you, can you give your name first, please? Uh, I'm Johnny Urquidez. U-R-Q-U-I-D-E-Z. Some of my concerns with the safety for the children is there's 12 children living in a single family residence that's built for a single family residence, not built for 12 children, six adults, one residence, and other helpers. This is a single family home that 12 children have to get along in. And when you're confined to one room with one adult and one other sibling, it's hard especially when you don't have adequate space inside the house or adequate space outside the house because it's a parking lot. The children won't be able to play outside. There's two major streets that are really busy with heavy traffic, which is Panorama and Haley, where BC, there's students coming and going all, all through the day. There's no sidewalks. So the sidewalk they're proposing is in front of their house only. But if you walk directly to the right or down the panorama, there's no sidewalk for these kids. The closest schools to these kids, these, this is a 20-minute walk with no sidewalks. An elementary school, Nichols, is a 38-minute walk 
Washington Middle School is a 20 minute walk. East High is a 58 minute walk. Now if they have transportation, now we're concerned about parking and getting 12 children ready for school in a single family resident house. Not only that, the adults as well. This house is not built for this. This is a business. This house is not built for a business. Just because you move a wall and call it this doesn't mean it's designed for that purpose. There's been plenty of accidents on these major roads. There's been, in the last year, there's been a rollover on that corner. There's been a motorcycle accident on that corner. There's been a pedestrian hit on that on Panorama. There's been two years back, this fire started in the bluffs. Where are these kids going to play at? They range from all ages. Now, supervising, they propose a parent has to supervise their 10-year-old and under at all times. 10-year-old and older at all times. How are you going to do that? What if you have to work? Who's, who's picking up the kids? They're not providing any transportation. They're not providing any child care. They're not providing any of that for these women. So who's going to take care of the children? That's where they're not having an adequate amount of staff to help these single mothers. Sorry. Where the alley that I believe where these children are going to end up is this is where all the kids walk through. They walk through the alleys. All these, this neighborhood doesn't have sidewalks. They walk, the kids walk through the alleys. Now, like she mentioned before, there's a lot going on in these alleys. Um, there's people that, that uh, they rummage through the trash. They, we've had our house, our shed broken into, we've had our trailer broken into, we had our batteries stolen, we'd have our security lights stolen in the last two and a half years that we lived there. I had cameras put up to, to provide security so I know what's going on. That's how I know what's going on in the alleys at all times. There's been drugs left on our property where people drive through the alleys and they pick up their drugs. So the reason why this community and our neighbors are so intact is because we watch out for each other. We know who's who. We know who's not supposed to be along there. And we, we, we communicate with each other. How are we going to do that? With 20 people living next door, we have no idea who they are. We have no idea who's coming and going. We have no idea, like, in a year, it's all going to change, right? They, prepare, they propose them living 12 to 18 months there, if not sooner. We're never going to know who our neighbor is, not, not to mention the staff. How often is the staff going to change? So these are some of the issues that we're, we're, we're thinking. And as far as safety for the kids, how are they going to get to school? They can't walk. There's no, even if the parent walks into school, there's still a safety hazard. There's no sidewalks. The kids, I'm just concerned about the kids. There's, there's just the bluffs. There's busy streets. There's no sidewalks. There's no place for the children to play. The alley is, is there's incidents in the alley with theft, graffiti, vandalism, um, everything. People defecating in the alley weekly. This is on a weekly basis. And this is where you want your children. They're going to put up a fence, but how are you going to, how are you going to prevent, how are they going to watch their kids that, that I have a seven-year-old and a 10-year-old. I can't. Keep, take my eyes off my kid, you know, they, they're, I can't have, watch my kid all day long and not ever take my eyes off them. You know, I don't see how that's, it's unrealistic. Them proposing that they can't have no food in their rooms, how are they going to enforce that? These are unrealistic. They can't have no food in the rooms for the kids. Or when they get hungry, they have to, I don't know how they're going to work that out. Some of these plans are just not, it's not designed for the children. This house is not designed for that many people. It's zoned as a single family resident. That's what it's zoned as. It's not for a business. This is a business. They're providing a service for the kid, for the fam, for these people. They have to do certain things and in return, they get certain things. It's a business. We don't need a business. This is a single family residence.
it's hard enough right now to watch the, the, the people with COVID going on and then you want to stick kids together. I, I know this is not going to go on forever, but this is not the right time for this. This is not the right location for this. It's too busy. You got buses. That, that's easy transportation for them, but what about, the, what about the traffic? They have to cross a big street to get, to get to those buses if they're kids. They, they don't have access to go to the grocery store unless they provide their own vehicle. That's a lot of traffic already in a place that's full of college students coming in and out. What are they proposing is, is just not, it's not, it doesn't meet the standards. This is a single family house. It doesn't meet their standards. They need a facility for what they're proposing. They need a place where the kids can play. They need a place where they don't have a conference room. How are they going to bring in people to help them with certain items? They don't even have a conference room or anything. Where are they going to, are they going to do this? In the living room? They don't have an environment. It's not built for this, what they're proposing. It's built for a single family residence. That's all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Hi, good evening, Commission. My name is Ryan Domboski. I initially wasn't going to speak tonight. However, in the previous presentation that um, was very good and very informative also, um, I had a lot of time to scroll through, and there are 250 pages of letters of support for Casa Esperanza. I do want to point out a couple things, because I had a lot of time in the previous presentation. I scrolled through every single zip code. There were three 93305s in all of those letters of support. And I'll tell you a couple things about those. One of them, I recognize the address, 1600 East Truxton. That's the homeless center. So we can throw that one out. The second one is the current owner of the home who's trying to sell it. I really hope that we can maybe look at her motivations in trying to do that. And the third one lived on Alta Vista, which is nine blocks west at best from this project. You have over 100 neighborhood, and those are neighbor signatures that are within, I believe, the four block radius of this project that we took the initiatives to actually go out, pound the pavement, get the signatures. I never had Casa Esperanza come to my house, and I am literally two houses kitty corner across the alley, and I can vouch for everything that Johnny spoke about with the issues from the alley, because we're always calling each other. Um, this is not a neighborhood support project. I can't believe that we're actually sitting here going, Casa Esperanza has no one, no one on Panorama, no one on Princeton, no support in this neighborhood. You know where they do have support from of those 250 pages? Oregon, Utah, Oklahoma, Florida. Those were the, you know, yeah, there's a lot of other like 93311s, 93312s, like the power zip codes in Bakersfield. Three zip codes, 93305. I want to talk about two other very quick points because I know everyone's going to be talking. They mentioned collecting data. I do want to point out two things that they mentioned in collecting data. They mentioned collecting data on graduations and jails. It's not exactly a breath of fresh air if you're the house next door, like Johnny and Kristen, or myself, just across the alley. Urban renewal. Johnny touched on this, sorry. Sidewalks. Great. Congratulations. You're going to put in sidewalks on Haley and Panorama. Not exactly sure what those sidewalks connect to, but good on you. I, it doesn't even make sense. So you're going to even change the look of the neighborhood and put in a business-like looking facility with sidewalks on two street corners that go nowhere doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I never thought I'd come to the Planning Commission seeking the protection of my neighborhood, but we have 100 plus people signing, hey, this is not the right place in our neighborhood. And again, you have a lot of people that don't live in our neighborhood being the only ones filling out an auto-generated form. Jim Mosier made a, a very interesting quote 
in terms of discussing the conditional use permit with you all. And I wrote it down because it was fantastic. Referencing his conditional use permit, his exact quote was, it's a big game we're playing with our conditional use permit if we don't follow it. It is, it is a big game. But it's also a game for us that have a stake in the neighborhood. And unless we're here, and unless the Planning Commission protects our neighborhood and protects us, it's a big game that we're being thrown into that we don't want to be a part of. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. My eyeballs on here, excuse me. Commissioners, thank you for allowing me to speak against the conditional use permit for Casa Esparza. I'm a longtime resident growing up in this neighborhood since the 1960s. So I'm very much against the permit for several reasons. I'm Our sorry, can you please state your name? I'm very sorry about that. My name is Ronald Wolf. Okay, go ahead. Our neighborhood, single family residences. To allow this, I feel, as holding a real estate license and a GRI designation, our property values are going to decrease and possibly suffer more blight. Once we open this door to Pandora's box, who's to say we'll start getting multiple homes requesting for more special permits? We have a beautiful, na mature neighborhood. With that being said, our property values are lower per square foot than the northwest and the southwest areas. Some of them are decline in values due to decay around the surrounding area and growth expansion to the south. I feel this will continue to degrade property values as it appears the city's approach to combating blight often is to just move the city further southwest and forget about the older properties and areas. These women and children very possibly are going to attract their father or fathers welcomed or not. With that will come excessive foot and vehicle traffic and parking issues. Recently, and I'm going to say probably within the last 24 months, this neighborhood petitioned to get residential parking permits. We'll have excess, we had excess cars to the front of most homes. I personally encountered everything prior to the permits from people having sex in their cars to having trash thrown out of the cars and left on the ground. There was also vandalism, which slowed down after the residential parking permits were put into place. We have had a recent upturn in theft, damage, and vandalism since the COVID. There are people driving the streets on the lookout for items to take or to vandalize. I would almost bet each person here tonight can make a comment on theft or vandalism that has occurred to their home. I don't think I need to add any more fuel to that fire. On any given day, we have excessive traffic up and down Panorama and adjoining streets well beyond normal operating speeds. I'm one block away from the subject property, and daily cars drive at unsafe speeds up and down the streets. I have seen a number of accidents in the area. Due to speed, I do not feel this area is safe for multiple young children. My last item is safety. This location is on a busy street where a child could be taken at a moment's notice. We currently have 10 persons within a one mile radius of this subject house who is listed on the Megan's watch list. Out of those 10 people, eight have been charged with sexual crimes against a child under the age of 14 and two charged with forcible rape. One person with three separate sex charges is currently in violation. This home sits on a busy street where a person could easily be taken advantage of. I am not in favor of this permit. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Okay. In order to manage our time, if you think you want to speak, please move closer to the uh, to the podium so that you can uh, take over next after the next person. Sir, please uh, state your name for the record and begin. My name is Scott Hare. Um, I live at 1201 Panorama Drive. First thing I want to do is thank all of you for your commitment to our city government and the time and effort that you put forward 
in the Planning Commission. It's not my first time speaking in front of it, and I know how hard you guys work to do this, and I appreciate it as a citizen. Um, I've lived at uh, Panama Drive since 1985. My wife has lived at the house. She uh, was there, her parents built the house, and I moved in after they passed away with my wife. We have raised our family in the neighborhood and watched the generational changes of the properties within the neighborhood. Um, that being said, I've driven by uh, 1421 Panorama Drive thousands of times, literally thousands of times. And I was uh, stupefied by um, Carolyn Gonzalez's support letter of Casa Esperanza. And not for the reason that you might think. Um, I understand her love for tending to young children and helping them out. Obviously, her work as a foster parent and the things that she did were phenomenal. Uh, but I was amazed that there were 20 kids living in that house and we never saw hide nor hair of them. Um, I'm also a little bit upset that through the years, not knowing that, I didn't take the opportunity to stop by and lend any help or assistance that she might need in her effort in raising those kids. Um, they were quiet neighbors, but after reading that letter, it completely explained the deteriorated condition of that house. For years, we have watched as that property has slowly gone downhill. And I now know it's because they probably didn't have the wherewithal to take care of the property like the rest of us do in the neighborhood. And uh, first it was the landscaping, it was the yard upkeep went downhill it was from being all the time inconsistent to just occasional. And then the outside, you saw it was deteriorating also. Along with that, we saw weird construction things done to the house that we now know were, you know, um, unlicensed, unpermitted uh, changes. And I really wish I had thought more about it and taken action towards those things and not allowed it to happen. Um, panorama homes are really costly to maintain, and I understand why the house deteriorated. Uh, water and electricity, when we talk about our bills to other people in the neighborhood or in the city, they are astounded by what we pay for water and electricity in those homes that we have up there. They are older homes. They don't have quite as modern insulation and that type of stuff in them, and it, it really is expensive. The upkeep is phenomenal. You have a person come in to do work in your house on Panorama, and it's like the bill is 20 to 25 percent higher because there's more studs in the walls, there's more things they gotta deal with, there's more problems with maintaining those homes. And if I try to do it myself, I end up with a very poorly done job that my wife hates me for. Um, the upkeep, the gardening, the landscaping, the pruning of the trees, the old trees that are up there, those are all costly things. And uh, keeping up our houses, and it, actually it's almost a business in itself to do that. Um, when I first heard of uh, Casa Esperanza from my, my neighbors, um, I didn't know anything about it and they gave me the, the stuff that had been supplied to them. And after reviewing the information about the project, it seemed to me that the uh, project was long on dreams but lacking in comprehensive planning. And I appreciate the help that city staff gave them on looking at household rules, but there were so many things that are missing in this thing. And I, I've been involved with a lot of projects in my, in my days where, where I've been on uh, boards that raise money for uh, different groups of things. I've been on large industry groups, and I've, I've, I've uh, managed those groups through the process. And so um, after reviewing their information about the project, I just seemed like it was long on dreams, but lacking planning. And by that I mean, um, you know, um, they only, they're only going to have, which has already been said, a, one living person with relief. They're very vague on their plan details uh, and their clients and their children. I didn't see anything, absolutely nothing, that had to do with the financial planning for the, for the project. 
to show that they were in it for the long game, that they, there were no projected uh, operations budgets, no projected income statement, nothing that made us that would make me confident to allow a zone change in our neighborhood for what my fellow neighbors are characterizing as a business. And there was no construction performa. And quite frankly, the stuff that's on the, the literature that they've put out looks like stuff that an architect does on the come. You know, they throw some stuff on paper, give you some pretty ink, make it look nice, give you some lines on paper to show you where the rooms go, but there's not a lot of work put into it that actually define the project. And if any of you, and you guys I'm sure have been involved with it, you know that those things change dramatically as you go through a project. Um, the other thing I saw was a truly lackadaisical attempt at neighborhood outreach and follow up on concerns. Um, and you guys had a, an amazing example for us with the CPU that you looked at before us. My gosh, that guy was amazing. What he was doing to get his project through, the thing that he did for the neighbors around that project, and the things that he did in front of you tonight were amazing. I thought I'd never see stuff like that. So, you know, absolutely no outreach to the people in the neighborhood. They, what they did was they went 300 feet from the subject property because that's what they're required to do. That's two lots in our neighborhood. I live at the other end of the block. There's four houses in between us. And I found out from my neighbors. So it just seems to me that really this is a, a group that's in its infancy. They don't have their feet on the ground with how to organize and structure and really develop these things. And the fact that they're asking for a conditional use permit change in the middle of all this kind of blows me away because it's like, why wouldn't you go into a zone neighborhood and get your operation working and make it work in a way that you could bring it to our neighborhood and say, look, it, this is what we're doing. Not refer to Alexandria House in LA or somewhere else. So after looking at it from that perspective, I said, well, what could go wrong for our neighborhood? Well, I see issues with labor and clients that, that haven't been addressed. You know, how are they gonna deal with it? They've got two people that are gonna be, maybe three, that are gonna be responsible for taking care of that house 24 seven. What happens if one or two of them get mad and walk out of the house? Where's the plan to fill those jobs back in? And if any of you have employed people or dealt with those situations, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, there's a lack of funding for a multitude of reasons that I've already explained. What happens if there's a dissolution of Casa Esperanza? What happens if that's conditional use permit that they put on that property? And then we end up, could end up with a vacant property for sale with a, CP, CU, uh, with a conditional use permit that actually increased the value of that property because it has a potential, potential to make uh, income while lowering our property value because now we've got a multi-residential house next to us in our neighborhood of single house dwellings. And is it gonna result in domino, uh, conditional use permits in the neighborhood? If they can do it, why can't I? You might as well just change the zoning of the whole neighborhood and get it over with, so at least we're all operating on the same ground and not be picking winners and losers. Uh, I've got to, and looking at the city's environmental review and determination, I do have some questions about that. You know, I saw that they, uh, in accordance with uh, section 15303, they uh, made a determination that the project didn't need a, uh, a environmental uh, impact report. But I'm wondering, has the city done any analysis citywide of multiple R1 zoning changes through conditional use permits? And I'm curious about that and uh, to allow boarding homes specifically. And if they, ha if they haven't, or if, you know, how many have changed throughout the community? 
There's other communities in the state since 2019 that have had to deal with conditional use permits and zoning changes where the, the state Supreme Court has said that you've got to consider future environmental changes. So if this city is allowing a bunch of conditional use permits for residential neighborhoods, how does that, what, when do we reach the tipping point when that actually changes the circumstances of the environmental impact report that, that, that were created under that vision? So I'm just curious as to whether or not we're keeping track of that and if they've done uh, if they've done anything that would look at, uh, you know, uh, traffic changes as a result of these over the overload of just one after another of these conditional use permits. And is, is Casa Esperanza, is Esperanza the first such change such as this that the city is allowed? And if so, how many are they going to allow? Those are questions that I just have. Uh, okay. In their findings, in harmony, uh, policy number three. I think that uh, gentleman over here already hit those marks, other than the nearest grocery store is a mile and a half away, unless you count a fast trip. And that's about three quarters of a mile away on the other side of BC. So that's where these people are gonna be going to get their food. And are they walking? There are sidewalks all the way to fast trip. There aren't sidewalks all the way to uh, Albertsons. Um, let me see what else I've got here. As far as the recreational areas, there's Panorama Park. Our neighborhood was very active in getting that park built. We donated a lot of money and time to doing it. And uh, that park, when we designated and got the county to work with us on it, we wanted to make sure that it wasn't treated as a recreational park. We wanted it just to be for a couple of things. Walking, flying, oh, a few things. Flying kites, which is a really important thing. And uh, we want it to basically be a walking park and be able to enjoy the beauty of the Sierras. So it's, it does have bocce courts now, and I'm surprised that they put those in, but you guys know how that works. Uh, anyways, uh, so the nearest, the nearest city park is 1.2 miles away over at Seaman Park over on Oswell. The other county parks that are around, there's three county parks, uh, and Two of them are nothing other than Panorama Park. The other two are nothing but grass. So there's really no parks with toys for the kids to play on, basketball courts, tennis courts, nothing like that. Okay, I'll go over here. I'm almost done. Uh, I think as Eric already did the diagnosis of the public comments in support of the conditional use permit. One thing that I did think was uh, kind of interesting is that uh, seventy-seven percent of the people lived west of ninety-nine and if they're looking for a neighborhood that has single home dwellings that has a community that really wants to have that 93312 is the zip code to look at because uh, eighty percent of those came from that zip code uh, anyways um, I understand the nature of the support for Casa, Casa Esperanza and I'm too for helping the homeless get off the street and on their feet. However, I cannot support our neighborhood being the experiment for an organization with no track record or experience in group living. It's a great idea. It's a dream. I had a friend tell me when I opened my new business, enjoy your dream because when you open it tomorrow, your dream dies and you're going to work. And there's a diff big difference between the two. If um, Alexandra House has an owner that l lives in their group home that is vested in the neighborhood, just like, just like we had a neighbor at the other end of my block that, for 20, for, that for, since 1999 raised 20 foster children without us ever knowing. She lived there. And the reason that works is because they live with the people, they love them, they cook for them, they watch what they're doing. And this model doesn't do that. The hundred people who live in our neighborhood said no, not because of the homeless, but because of the lack of preparation by Casa Esperanza on this project. And our lack of faith in their ability to pull it off. It's that simple. 
I would encourage them to find a good, pl good place in a neighborhood already zoned for their needs. And then I hope they ask us for our help and we'll be there to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other speakers in opposition? Please uh, state your name and begin. Hi, my name is Nicole Yaksich, and I live three houses down uh, from the proposed um, location um, with my husband and my two young children. And I just want to say a couple of quick words. Um, our neighborhood has really tried to work with Casa Esperanza in the meetings that we had to try to come to some kind of thing that can we make it work for everybody. And it clearly is a business, um, and our suggestions don't allow it to work. Having less people in the home, um, they said the numbers don't work. Um, asking if one of the board members could live there the first year just to make sure since this is their first project, can we get it off the ground? Can we ensure that it is going to work, that it is going to be safe, that the children are going to be watched, that the parent, the mothers are going to get along? Could you just for your first year do that? to make sure that this is really gonna work? And the answer was no. And it's extremely frustrating when we are young families in the neighborhood. I was raised one block over. I've known the neighborhood my whole life. I love raising my family there. We have a lot of concerns right now with the safety in the area. The, the, it's definitely changed. Um, we know of the homeless problem. We know the homeless problem in Panorama, Panorama Park when we look out of our front windows. The problem is, is that, or I guess the concern I have is we as families are all working together to try to do the best to keep our neighborhood going and keep it as safe as possible. We don't need a business. We don't need people making income off of people living there. We need another family in the neighborhood. We need another set of eyes that can watch the neighborhood that can grow up with our families. And so again, I know it's been said several times tonight, but it's, it's hard that when we have bought into a property that is zoned to be a residential property that we want to stay for the long term and raise our families that it could potentially be turned into business property and then by opening that door what will come after that thank you for your time tonight thank you of the other speakers and opposition please state your name and begin robert garcia i'll be very brief Try not to repeat everything that you've already heard. But I will say this again. This is a one-family box that we're talking about putting six families in. And I've been involved in law enforcement and public service for over 20 years. I know how that goes or how it can go. I'm not a, a fortunate teller either. I can't tell the future, and none of us can. And we all, I think, applaud the mission that these folks are, have. It sure sounds good, and, um, but there are some issues. Another thing, we're sitting here, and I'm listening to the first uh, cup discussion, and now I'm wondering, am I going to be that house that's now behind that hotel, that gas station that you guys were talking about that shouldn't have happened or wasn't planned? Because now I've been in that house for 16, uh, no, 18 years. And I've put probably over $100,000 of hard-earned money into that house, doing most of the work myself. I've seen the condition of that home. And if we're talking about putting hundred grand into that house, I don't see it really making that huge of a dent, especially, and I don't even know what the inside looks like. But my point is this. When I bought that house, it was all single-family dwellings. It was wonderful, it was a dream come true to, to have a house on Panorama. And now, I'm looking at, even though it doesn't fit the definition, an apartment, a box with six families in it, right next to mine. There's nothing wrong with apartments, but that's not what I bought into. I feel like I'm gonna be on Gosford and Stockdale with the Shell Station in the pizza place right behind my house. I wonder how many of those people would have bought there had they known that all those businesses were gonna roll in with these businesses that they didn't want. And you guys have the ability to control that. I, don't, I know it's not exactly the same scenario, but it's a possible redo. 
on your part. Um, and then the only other thing I, that concerns me is we're talking about structure, we're talking about rules and, and, and following them and how important it is. I'm kind of curious how, how strong this group is, this group that is for homeless women and children. Are they going to kick a homeless woman and child out of that house if they're not following the rules? Over 20 years they've been operating and two people have been kicked out. I really find that hard to believe. I'm not, I don't mean to call anyone a liar, but are we really holding these, these standards up that will help keep this household and the neighborhood in harmony? I, don't, I might be a little jaded, but I'm, I'm kind of doubting that. Uh, again, I applaud their mission, and like Scott says, you know, it doesn't mean we're not here to help, but I don't think it fits where they're, uh, where they're trying to do this. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and begin. My name is Dina Hale. I'm the new kid on the block. Just moved in two months ago. And all the stories that I hear now, I will have a home for sale. Um, Kristen, Johnny, Nicole, and Mr. Garcia, they welcomed our family like no other neighborhood has ever done when you moved in. I know the neighborhood is very loving, kind, and wants to help whoever's there. But from my understanding, Casa Esperanza has been very vague on what they want to do. In a statement just recently in the Bakersfield, California, it was stated that our affluent prominent neighborhood is no longer a safe neighborhood. But Casa Esperanza, who stated that, is wanting to move these families into our neighborhood that is no longer safe. So why? I looked up the state's, I'm sorry, the state test scores for the schools that these children will be going to. They are the lowest you can get. They're 1% tend be in the highest. None of us would want our children going to those schools. That is elementary is a one, junior, uh, middle school is a one, and East Bakersfield High School is a four. East Bakersfield High School doesn't even meet the state standards for this, um, the state test scores. But they want to bring these families to give them a better life into a neighborhood but on one hand, they talk about how unsafe the neighborhood is. So they're contradicting, contradicting themselves. Casa Esperanza, a single family home doesn't sound like it meets the criteria for your multi-family needs. Public schools are well below average. An unsafe neighborhood, a busy corner location, cramped living conditions, insufficient number of bedrooms and bathrooms, and you, Casa Esperanza are claiming you are doing this for the better of these families. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other speakers in opposition? Seeing none, uh, I'd like to move into the rebuttal period. Um, commissioner Chair, I'm you skipped number six. The, whether any commissioner has any questions to, uh, for the public? Number six. Are we doing that before rebuttals? Correct. Okay. Then, does any commissioner have any questions for the public on this item? Remember, this is not the time to express any opinions on the matter. It is only time to ask questions. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Cater would like to speak. Commissioner Cater. Sorry, I hit my mic again. Um, this actually is a question for staff. I was just wondering if uh, staff could provide a quick um, clarification of this project. Part of the condition of rule is sidewalks, but it's a neighborhood that does not have a consistent sidewalk uh, system in place. How does this, how do, what's the city's approach in 
Is it an incremental improvement to the neighborhood or is there some sort of plan that this project would be tying into to make the pedestrian access or the pedestrian network more cohesive in this neighborhood? You know, I may defer to public works, but I will answer some of that is with this change in use, um, that's our time to get development standards that need to be brought up to current city standards and sidewalks for this site um, have been identified as being, being needed as part of this project. And then um, following up, it's a question I think one of the um, neighbors raised as well, and Mr. Johnson, you and I spoke earlier but didn't. Um, do you have numbers on the number of uh, boarding houses that exist throughout the city of Bakersfield in, in R1 neighborhoods currently? Uh, yes. Uh, in the last approximately 15 years, there have been 21 conditional use permit requests, 16 have been approved, 4 have been denied, and 1 has been withdrawn. Okay. Thank you. Any other commissioner questions? Uh, I have I have one question. Has there been any uh, have have you received financial statements from this organization in in part of your uh, in part of your review of this project? We did not. Thank you. Now may I move to the rebuttal period? You, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. This will be an opportunity to rebut. Uh, if you'd like to speak, no, this, before you get started, I just want to be aware that it's going to be a five minutes per side, not five minutes per person. So you have a total of five minutes. The clerk will start the timer, and uh, looks like we're ready to begin. Jim Mosier, on behalf of Casa Esperanza, um, there's so much to to address here, um, I just want to start with neighborhood outreach. We reached out to the neighbors to set up a meeting in June of this year. And Ms. Equites was very, very gracious and said, I will set that up. That was June 12th. And uh, we did go 300 feet. We did deliver materials. We actually sent Ms. Equites the electronic copies. And she said, I'll, I'll be the the spokesperson, and they call her the commissioner, actually, and she was going to distribute it to everybody in the neighborhood. And um, at any rate, uh, we had another meeting on July 6, and after that meeting, it was very clear. The message from the neighbors was very simple. When we asked, is there anything we can do to make this project work here? And the answer was, go someplace else. That's, I'm paraphrasing, but go someplace else. So it's very hard to speak into that listening when there's no room or no gap for dialogue. I want to address about uh, a couple of things about the property itself. It has solar, the electricity bills are manageable, and the total renovation, I mean like really total renovation, uh, is going to put in a water-wise landscape. Um, the trees will be pruned, I'll see to it. I sit on the Tree Foundation of Kern on its board, and I'm a master gardener, and those are the kind of things we love to do. Um, unsafe neighborhood. Uh, we didn't say that. I know that Ms. Hale said that we said that. The neighbors you heard tonight said it's unsafe. And the statistics don't really bear that out, at least if there is crime, it's not being reported, uh, at least religiously. Um, from May 2nd through October 28, there were 119 crimes within a half mile of 1421 Panorama. Majority burglary, auto theft, breaking into autos, and uh, larceny or theft from property. There's only one that shows up, a larceny, um, and it's within the 300 feet of the home, but there's nothing else on the block. As to sex offenders, there are nine, uh, as Mr. Ayers attested to. One is in violation, and those nine are within one mile. The numbers I just gave were a half mile for crime, one mile. And uh, that has stayed relatively constant. When we first looked at it, there were 10. There is one. I don't know if it's next to Mr. Ayers, but it looks to be in the 1300 or 1200 block of Panorama. So it's down west of where we are. And that is not the person who is in um, uh, a violation. Parking. The current property, I know it's difficult to see unless there's one that was peering over the fence, has 13 paved parking spaces in the backyard. So the play area is small. So in the 
architectural rendering, uh, you can't see it, but certainly in the landscape plan, you can see that we brought that down to nine and expanded the children's play area. Schools. McKenna Venti funds do allow for parents to keep their kids in the same schools, so transportation will have to be arranged. Uh, we don't envision kids walking 20 minutes to school. Necessarily, their parents will have to decide or their mothers will have to decide what that looks like. Um, Ms. Yaksich said, you know, we asked, Did, could you ensure that you'll make it work? That was not the vernacular used. The vernacular was, can you guarantee that this will work? And of course we said, we can't guarantee anything. I mean, we will do our level best and we're committed to make this work, but we can't guarantee. As for producing income, um, she mentioned that as well. We're a nonprofit, so it's just kind of antithetical um, to make a profit. Food, it's in our documents. The food will be uh, purchased collectively, jointly by the staff and select people for everyone in the household. They don't have their own food. There is no own food in the house. And the food's not allowed in the rooms for a specific reason, is that's just something really difficult to manage, especially with kids and with potential pests, vermin, and just the mess that comes with that. Uh, $100,000 is not enough, according to Mr. Garcia. Well, we are putting at least $100,000 in where we get a lot of don donated services. All of the architectural work was Mr. done. Mr. Moser, you have 30 seconds left. Okay. Finally, what I want to say is that it's not a business. Um, I do understand the neighbors have some regrets that they, their neighborhood's not what it used to be. But as far as we see it, we will be a net addition, a net be a benefit, an augmentation to the neighborhood. And that's what we intend to be. Uh, and the zoning map for Alexandria House, by the way, it's the only single family or s only f single family uh, residences in what has been upzoned Thank you, Mr. to an R4. Does anybody uh, on the opposing side would like to rebut? Remember, you have a total of five minutes. So if there's more of you that want to speak, let's manage your time, please. Madam Clerk, please, re please reset the timer. Um, I've worked with many nonprofits that that have Look at you to say your name again. My name's sir. Scott Hare. I've worked with nonprofits. M most of them have balance sheets, income statements, operational models, uh, and and calculations of how to move forward with their projects. And for him to say that it's antithetical because it's not a for-profit organization is absolutely asinine. And it just leads to my conclusion that they're not equipped. The fact that they've jumped into this to do a conditional use permit on their first project and they don't even have the nuts and bolts in piece in place to just do a regular project in a neighborhood that they're fit for. That is why we don't want them in this neighborhood. They are showing us nothing that shows professionalism. They wait for one of our citizens, one of our people in our neighborhood to get the information out to the others in the neighborhood. I live a block away. A block away, not one person has been by my house, talked to anybody in my house, had anything to do with us. Yet, that house impacts my property. And by the way, that house was never listed for sale, never on the, never on the multiple listing, and we never had an opportunity to buy it. I guarantee you there's people in this audience that have friends and, and family that, that would like to m live in our neighborhood, and they never had an opportunity to even get that house. Kristen Yarkides, um, I get that, that there's no guarantee to anything that anyone does, and that is completely understandable, but there are some things that can be planned out and provisions thought about before problems arise. And my, my disconnect is that I'm going to be living with successes and the challenges that come with this experiment. My only repercussion if this project goes through is to report to code enforcement, which I've had discussions with code enforcement officers, and they are swamped. So priorities. Um, all I'm going to be able to do is report, report, report until it becomes I'm that neighbor that just reports everything. I'm that neighbor that calls the cops when there's people outside yelling at each other and I'm not sure what's going on. And honestly, the, the police have, have 
a multitude of things going on against, uh, again, they prioritize what they respond to. I've called the police because I had a guy hop the fence uh, in the RV fence in my backyard from the alley. We've talked about it, a lot of challenges. We've learned to kind of mitigate it. Um, I've called the cops because there was a guy in my backyard at 7.30 in the morning and I didn't know what he wanted. He said he was running from somebody and I said, well, I, you're gonna have problems with me too. So uh, no one ever came out. My, my point is we cannot rely on the police and the fact that things probably might be followed um, because the residents that live there all the time, especially right now in COVID when everyone's still at home, we are the ones that are going to suffer if this experiment is not successful. And so we are very emotional about that because we don't get to go someplace else at the end of the day and kind of brush off whatever didn't quite work that well. So we are very emotional about this. We are very invested in making sure that whatever happens to this property is what's best for the neighborhood. Um, and we obviously respect that there are certain uh, rights that a property owner has to use their property for. Um, but this project would truly impact the neighborhood and that's why you see so many of us here today. Thank you. Thank you. I just had Johnny Yukides, just had a couple of things to say. They were saying they're looking for the best thing for the neighborhood. But if you look at their forms, they're saying that if, if a child gets hurt on their property, they're not responsible. If a guest gets hurt on their property, they're not responsible. If damage is done to any property, they're not responsible. How is that the best interest for our neighborhood? Thank you. Thank you. There's about 30 seconds left to rebuttal on opposition. I don't see any speakers, so we'll move on. I'll now close the uh, public hearing on this item and return it to the commission for comment and action. Are there any commissioners would like to speak on this item? <laughs> Ms. Lomas. <laughs> I wanted to play backup. Oh, I wasn't planning on speaking first, so let me formulate some thoughts. The first, my first thought is extreme sadness. Yeah. These are women and children. These aren't crackheads, they're women and children. I'm so sad that this is the conversation we're having. The people that, that I'm hearing that, that, that of, our, of concern are women, okay? These women have custody of their children, so that means that they are deemed by our government to be safe parents, safe and responsible parents. And when we start judging people and deeming them unfit, we don't even know them. When are they gonna judge us? I'm sorry, I'm sad. I, I, I didn't think I was going to talk first, so I'm, I'm just really sad that, that this is the first, I've been on this commission a long time, and this is the first one that moves me of what I've heard. Our world has changed. We can all agree to that, right? Yeah, we all, we all see it. I don't care what zip code you live in, we all are seeing it. I really, as an idealist, would love to, to have total certainty with zoning. I would love it, it'd be great. But our world changes. So since our world changes, we have to respond to those changes. So, so what, are we, what are we talking about tonight? We're talking about homelessness. It's a real thing, it affects every zip code.
we also have a housing problem. And I'm going to try not to get on too tall of a soapbox on this, but our government has, has made how, the, the, not our government, I don't want to blame government because it's not government's fault. We have, the government wants money to operate. They have to have money to operate. So, but then they want things. So then the state of California has just announced a whole bunch of stuff in recent, recent times that says, all right, your housing has to have solar, your housing has to have sprinklers. Your, the state of California has, has demanded so much that housing isn't affordable anymore. So guess what? We have homelessness. And, and we have an opportunity to help women and children. And I look at a project as, is it, is it right for where it is? That's the discussion right now. That's what we're having right now. Is this, is this, we've all agreed that it's, it's a viable project and we need it. We all agree on that. But is it the right place? Okay. The size, the location, what's there, what's affordable. You can't just go build this without it being a whole bunch more money. So to house six women and their children, to build it from ground up with all the fees and all the, all the stuff that the state of California requires, you can't. There, where's all this money gonna come from? Us, the taxpayers. Okay, so, so now here we've got a project here that, that's relatively affordable to take care of six women and their children. That's doable, and there's some people collectively that have got together and said, okay, we'll put up the money to do it. So I look at, back to what I look, like, look at, is, does this project make sense, and would I live next to it? That's how I look at it. When, it, when, you hear, when I hear everybody talk, and then I go, all right, would I live next to it? I would. I would. I, 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 it's women and children. It's not drug addicts. It's women and children. Now, one thing I don't remember, um, I don't remember if they'll be drug tested. I think that should be in your program. I don't know if I get to say that, but I think there should be random drug testing. Um, I think that might give some assurances to, but we're, we're, not, we're talking about people that they are not drug addicts, they have custody of their children, and they need a home. Okay, I've talked long enough. Thank you, Commissioner Lomas. Uh, that, that did inspire the other ones to log in, so. <laughs> so uh, we'll go to uh, Commissioner Bell, please. So I'm going to call you Barbara again. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> listen, uh, I so appreciate what you uh, what you've said. Now, so um, uh, I'm going to give you a little insight to my background. Uh, I don't know what all of my other commissioners have done, but in 1998, I had the honor of going on to the board of the rescue mission. Later on, I was able to uh, be blessed with being the chairman of that board for a while. Uh, I actually have one of the greatest honors of my life is hiring Carlos Baldovinos, the director of the rescue mission, has done remarkable things. I've been part of planning and being involved in three transitional houses, four women, four men, uh, dealt with homelessness at the highest level, been on every committee you could even imagine regarding this. So to some of Barbara's points that really come from our hearts, not just this city, well, let me do th that first. This city just made a magnificent investment in a uh, program dealing with not just homeless, but every person that's on the street. They're gonna continue to spend millions and millions of dollars every year to impact that. I was a part of that committee. I was part of pushing very hard to our city manager at the time. <clears throat> Sorry, I have a little bit of a thing going here. Uh, but. When I started into the homelessness issues, it wasn't in me. I just wanted to be on the board. I thought it was a cool thing. 
Now it is one of the most driving issues in my life. There's nothing that I can think of that I care more for than my community and the men and women that are on the street. They have impacted me almost daily, good, bad, and indifferent. And I deeply care what happens to the men and women. Because uh, I look at it this way. There could be that day that I'm there. I don't want to do anything to them that I wouldn't hope someone would do or not do for me. Uh, I applaud this nonprofit and trying so hard to impact these gals, but I know exactly, and I'm telling you I do, I know exactly what they're going through. I know exactly what the impacts are on women in transitional housing, the children, how it works. I work with Carlos on it, I work with endless committees. Uh, I am sorry that these, uh, these neighbors are, I don't know, believing the worst, maybe. I don't, I don't know. But I, with you, would live next door to this. And uh, my wife would be there every day. My children probably, I, you know, they, they would, uh, would want to be a part. Um, and, and, and it is difficult. I get it. I spent hours with my staff on Monday after getting this report asking them these same questions you've been asking all night and communicating to us. Every one. And I got similar, ex almost exactly the same kind of answers. Uh, not in my neighborhood, maybe. But you know what? After I explained to them the depth of what the system looks like and why somebody has to step into the middle of it, they started to change. And I think Casa Esperanza, uh, I applaud what you're doing, but even more so, when you are trying to explain how this works and how it's so hard to understand and all the myths, myths, my staff are some of the best people I know, and they didn't understand. I, the, the barrier was enormous. The beliefs in all of us are, are broken. Uh, I believe in what you're doing, uh, and, I, and, and, and I am sad, too, because I know how hard it is for, for people to dig inside and understand. 22 years ago, I started getting involved. I can't tell you how many years it took for me to really get it, and uh, uh, that's it. I can go on and on, but that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Bell. Uh, Commissioner Wade. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I grew up in the area. The, that stretch from Haley to, well, into La Cresta, that's, that was my, my bike riding territory. I was there every weekend as a kid. In addition to that, there are a number of people in this room the, from the, the neighborhood that I've known since I was a child, uh, and then I respect quite a bit. Um, Commissioner Lomas, you mentioned that we have a housing problem in the state, and you weren't ready to blame government for it. Um, I am. It's a government-caused housing problem in the state of California. Here, we have a group, a non-governmental group, private citizens, not-for-profit, not willing to step up and do something about this. Uh, that's a powerful thing. Um, I heard some smart comments about the zip codes of the people that, are, that wrote in to support on a form letter. And uh, I have to say, I did the exact same thing. I looked at, I went through every single one and looked at the zip codes. And I was disappointed to find that unlike the 93305 area code that I grew up in and where this house is located, there, there were only a few 05s. Um, that being said, there were a lot of questions about this operation and if it was a business making income from the people there, which were the, the quotes. I also know people that are involved in this project, and they're good people, and their hearts are in the right place. 
and they're not trying to make money off these people. That is the last thing that they're doing. Um, so if we acknowledge that there's a housing problem, we acknowledge the mission of this organization, so then where does, the, where does it go? It has to go somewhere. This house has to go somewhere. Where does it go? Come up with a better option than this place here. I've gone by this house thousands of times in my life also. What's better than this? And, um, you know, the comment being, you know, 93312 is the, is the most prominent zip code that was listed on the people that supported this project. I happen to currently, for the time being, live in 93312. And you're right. There should be a Casa Esperanza there in addition to 93305. So I'm in support of this project. Thank you, Commissioner Wade. Uh, Commissioner Cater. Thank you. I appreciate all the commissioner's comments. I think it's given me some time to formulate my thoughts and uh, uh, share Commissioner Lomas's uh, kind of emotional response to, uh, I think we as a commission encounter a lot of uh, kind of fear of, of the other a lot at this board and I always have a hard time hearing it, whether it's an apartment project, whether it's smaller lot sizes and I think um, it does kind of pull at your heart and it makes you a little bit sad as, you know. But on a hopeful note, I have been so encouraged this past year to see a city that has struggled with homelessness and homelessness becoming more prevalent and no matter what zip code you're in. And taking a proactive approach, um, I think the city opening the Calcutt um, Brundage Lane facility was, an, was a positive step in being proactive and solution oriented and caring for people at a human level. And I think um, it was very encouraged to see um, Casa Esperanza and its, um, its attempt to look at a, you know, a nonprofit solution to the problem. I, I really, um, I, you know, a couple commissioners have said that they would live next to this project. I also live in the older part of Bakersfield. I live in downtown Bakersfield and I do live next to projects like this. And I think, um, I think we're a community that often thinks we need to be in the newest gated community with other people like us, but I think communities really thrive when diverse groups of people can come together and coexist. And I, for one, am so, feel it's a privilege to, that my daughters are gonna grow up in an environment where they know everyone is not like them. And they, they will see that the renters across the street that are only there for four months because their life is in transition are just as impactful and just as meaningful relationships as my neighbors in the Victorian house that they've put millions of dollars into renovating, you know? And I think that is actually a benefit. I mean, and I think looking at, um, I've always loved the Panorama neighborhood, and I think one thing I love about it is that this neighborhood welcomes so many people from all over Bakersfield into its doors every day. I mean, you're directly to the east, you know, I, I'm gonna butcher the numbers, but, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of students come each day to better themselves, to, to learn, to be the future of Bakersfield, you know, to the north. The bluffs and the, the emerging panorama preserve below, you know, becomes this great outdoor venue for all of Bakersfield. I've, you know, driving panorama right now during COVID when, you know, recreational opportunities are more limited. It's just really inspiring to see people utilizing that connection to nature. Um, and I just, one thing I really appreciate in this searching for a site for a, whose mission is to help women and children out of homelessness is the thoughtfulness in sighting. Um, I, I um, really enjoy being about 75% pedestrian, like to hit, use my car as little as possible, but for me that's a choice. But as for somebody who that's not a choice, that's their only option, I think the thoughtful sighting of not just a bus line, but a transit center that can give connections to not just one route, but to many, many different parts of our community opens a world of opportunity for these women. Um, I think the connection to nature and green space um, is a luxury that's afforded to people often that just have, that have cars and the ability to travel at leisure. And so I think the ability to walk to a green space is just really, I think is, um, is encouraging. And so, um, I would just say, um, I think as our conversation continues, um, one thing that I 
think is in, inspire is is a great tool in the conditional use process is that is that there is a list a set of conditions that Casa Esperanza has to comply with to be a good neighbor and I think um, and I think that is something that could be used to the benefit of the neighborhood to know what is expected of this operation and give a metric to um, to demystify some of the conditions of what how they're going to operate and I do think um, I am more in line that we are the Bakersfield Planning Commission and we do not have the expertise or the knowledge to judge a nonprofit in their operation. We are here to look at compatibility of land use and mitigating factors in, you know, how can they be a good neighbor to this wonderful neighborhood? And so um, I still I have a couple questions on that, but I think I'd like to give other commissioners a chance to speak. Um, and then I'll probably ask a few questions of staff uh, at a later time. Commissioner Bauer. You know, being born and raised in Bakersfield, one of the things I love about Bakersfield is the opportunity. A kid like me who grew up not too far away from uh, Panorama, but a kid from me, like me from Cottonwood, who was able to later go to Congress and now be on the commission. I was afforded those opportunities because of a phenomenal school, but later I left and went to college out of state, but Bakersfield College, and I look at Bakersfield College being here, and I, and I think the opportunity that these families, these mothers will get to be at one of the top community colleges in California, but more importantly, they have a phenomenal children's center, and I think about the opportunities that Bakersfield College has been able to afford me. And so I think that what makes Kern County one of the 10th most generous cities or counties is the fact that we have a heart and the fact that we continue to give back and the, and the fact that we look out for our neighbors. And so uh, I echo the sentiments of, uh, of my distinguished colleagues here and I'm in support of this project. Mr. Rudding, do you like Thank you. All right, I'll just uh, add a couple of comments. I, I think that uh, um, I, I didn't want to totally dismiss uh, some of the issues that the homeowners raised. And uh, uh, I, I don't know if it's, in our, if it's in our purview to ask Public Works to look into what's going on in that alley behind them and can we help out a little cleaning, I don't know. Um, some of the concerns about the, the location, I, I, get, I get those concerns, I really do. Um, but I, I, have to, I have to agree with the other commissioners that, you know, I, I was shocked when I first started wanting to do things at the homeless center, uh, how many women and children were there. Uh, as a board member at the Boys and Girls Club, you know, we reach out and try to help uh, children. And we were shocked to find out that there was 100 children at the homeless center. Because you don't think about, you know, children being homeless with their parents. And so uh, there's a truly a big, big need for the transitional housing for these women that are just trying to raise their children. And these people are, when you go and talk to them at the homeless center and other places, you know, uh, it's not like you might imagine in your mind you're dealing with some drug addict or whatever. You know, uh, you know, most of these women are situationally homeless, and you know they've lost a job, lost a spouse, whatever, and, and they find themselves in this in this horrible situation. And so, the need for that transitional housing is great. Uh, I get it that uh, you know that there's a lot of fear about what uh, what it might bring. I I think those are unfounded, to be perfectly honest with you. I think that you'll find that these people that you'll be meeting uh, will be the kind of people that you want to have in your neighborhood. And I thought about it when I read this report uh, over the weekend. Uh, would I have it in my neighborhood? I live in uh, 93309, 
Um, and uh, I live in a, a similar tract home. Uh, and uh, if it was on the corner on my block, I I'd be okay with it. So uh, that's all I have to say. Uh, but I don't know, uh, Mr. Johnson, is it possible for us to ask Public Works to see what they can do about that alley? Uh, yeah, staff can look into that either with Public Works or Code Enforcement. And, and I wanted to say about uh, the comment from uh, one of the women here that, you know, she feels like she's going to be the cop of the neighborhood and have trouble getting through to anybody to help. And... Uh, I, our, our code enforcement department is outstanding. Uh, they get on top of stuff right, right away. I, I, I've been asked by some people to say, hey, they're trying not doing whatever in my neighborhood, <clears throat> and I'll call up, and they've already been on it. And uh, so if you have a problem with code enforcement not getting out timely to handle any problems in your neighborhood, I, I encourage you to call the staff here or uh, call your councilman because your councilman will be sure to call somebody to get that taken care of. <laughs> so uh, that being said, I think I can be quiet now. So is there any motion here from anybody? Or did you have another question, Mr. Gator? Oh, yeah, I guess I'll just ask staff some, and I don't know if it's more questions or just maybe talking out the process. So, um, so conditional use process, um, just for the residents in the audience. Essentially, um, it is something that is revocable if the conditions of approval are not met. Isn't that, uh, Mr. Johnson, would you kind of talk through that process a little bit just for the neighbor's benefit? Uh, sure, there was a couple comments made. Um, Ms. Caesar noted that this conditional use permit is conditioned in a way that it would be difficult for a, a a different operator to come in, which is true. Um, the conditions are specifically for this site. Uh, if a different operator came in and said, I can't meet that condition, then the conditional use permit would have to either come back to your commission and revise the conditions or get a brand new conditional use permit. Um, if the conditions are not complied with, uh, and then again, we do um, ask the public to call code enforcement. Uh, code enforcement will go out, they will do investigation. Uh, they allow the due process to take effect. If that is not being rectified, uh, we will come back to your commission with our findings and it will be up to your commission to either, again, revise conditions. You can make those conditions more strict or you could initiate revocation proceedings, proceedings which in case, in that case, we would come back yet again to your commission with even more information uh, and for the public to participate in the revocation of the CUP. Thank you for talking that through. Uh, I don't have any other questions. Okay. Can I get a motion from somebody uh, to do something? Yeah. I make a motion to adopt staff's recommendation and approve the CUP. And I'll second. That was uh, Mr. Cater making the motion and Ms. Lomas uh, second. Uh, Madam Clerk, can we have a vote? Chair Coleman? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll let you do the roll call or the vote and then I would like to read the appeal period. I'm the sorry. Appeal. After your vote, I would like to read the appeal for the audience because this is an appealable to City Council. Okay. Thank you. Let's, uh, Madam uh, Clerk, can we have a vote, please? Okay. Um, I've opened up the voting. Mm -hmm. Motion passes. Thank you. And Mr. Johnson, do you have some more comment regarding that? Yes, I would. Uh, I would like to state that decisions of the commission are subject to appeal by any person that believes they are adversely affected. The appeal must be filed in writing within 10 days from the date of the commission's decision. The appeal must be addressed to the city council and include the appellant's interest in or relationship to the project, identify the decision appealed, and address facts and reasons why the commission's decision should not be upheld, and that language is also on the agenda that's uh, handed out at the door. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, that moves us to item 6C, which was the carryover from item 4B, which is the... Uh, 
that correct? Uh, Chair, Chair Coleman, I think it was 5E. I'm sorry. No, it was four. Well, it wasn't the uh, wasn't it the uh, item that we had to do with the uh, uh, was it five? five it was five, five e. e. I'm yeah. sorry, I, I got confused by your. E. I had a note here about your uh, conflict on four. That's why I had it down as four. Y yeah, I'm sorry. It's five e, which was the uh, amendments to the municipal code. So that's now our six c. Uh, yes, and I'm going to truncate this presentation. I did speak with uh, Commissioner Cater on this, so I'm just going to very briefly speak, and then I'll turn it over to the Commissioner. So, so in June 2020, Councilmember Gonzalez made a referral to the Planning and Development Committee for staff to review parking reduction for residential uses within the Central District, Central District and other mixed-use areas. Uh, in September 2020, the Planning and Development Committee was presented the information on the ability to accommodate such parking reductions. Following staff's presentation, public comments, and deliberations, the committee directed staff to prepare an ordinance update to the parking requirements for residential projects by addressing tandem parking, guest parking, and reductions based on density of development. Uh, that was provided um, to your commission as part of the staff report. Uh, I believe Commissioner Cater um, has some comments that we need to further work out, so I'm not sure if, and I'll leave it to Commissioner Cater, if this warrants a continuance to, let's just say, December 3rd, or if this is referred back and we would re-advertise it to come back at a later date. Yeah, I think, um, unless anyone else has comments to make, I, I would like to propose that it's continued to our next Planning Commission meeting um, for full discussion, also in full disclosure, to give uh, me more time to ask staff questions and research a little more. And given the fact that we have an applicant waiting on a 915 timeline, if that is agreeable to staff, I'd like to propose that we continue the item to next planning commission meeting. Then I would make I would make the recommendation that a motion is made to continue till to December 3rd, 2020 as a regular agenda item. Would you like to make that recommendation? Yes. That motion? It, okay. Uh, I think we need a second. You're gonna, you're gonna, I'll do it. Okay. Thank you. So that was Mr. Cater and Ms. Lomas, uh, a second. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, can we have a vote, please? I'm going to open voting. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so now we're back to uh, item 6D, which is uh, the uh, item 5, I'm sorry, item 6A from before. We're coming back to that issue. Uh, do we need to review where we're at? <laughs> so. I would just note uh, that we did give the applicant a copy of the CO, C1, and C2 zones. Uh, I'll let you speak well, if it's okay with the commission. Yeah, okay. if you just state your name again and we'll put it on the record again. Yeah, it's Jose Lynch. So uh, Gary and I reviewed, Gary Simmons and I reviewed this together and I'll I will make sure that he, he had to leave, I'll make sure that he understands and sees a copy of everything. I'm not sure if you want to go through all of this now, but what I would, what, what I would ask is that we, subject to any title process issues we have in, in restricting the deed, and we think we can get through this, but we would issue the deed restriction, process it, and give it to you. My request would be that you would You'd approve um, C2 zoning subject to the to our volunteer deed restriction, and so I, I have circled and X'd the goods and the bads. I don't know if you want me to go through all of them. There's an overhead right next to you, to your right. I'll just read it if you can't read it. So I'll start with C. So C2 covers, tell me what C2 covers. C, oh, C0 and C1 as well, right? That's correct. Sorry, those are my notes. <laughs> so. Yeah, so we, we, anything with an X on it, we, we just mutually agreed, and you tell me if you guys disagree. An X would be um, 
restricted, as an O would be acceptable. Okay. There's a lot. This may take a while. I want to move you guys with all this. Okay, you ready to turn over? Okay, there's more on this one. So the only acceptable one on this one would be a camera and photography supply. Um, sorry, a computer, software store, department store, um, flooring, more, more retail type stuff, hobby, toy shop. But for the most part, all the other things, like car washes and all that kind of stuff are out. You got automobiles, yes or yes and no. So which is uh, which, which number are you on? Yeah, no, an X is no. So I have XX. Anything with an X on it's no. It, become, it becomes a deed restriction. Okay. Sorry. So the only acceptable items here would be home furnishing, kitchen, glassware, shop, or whatever, and then a hospital, um, luggage and leather goods, musical instrument store, paint, glass, wallpaper store, radio, television, other consumer electronics store, restaurant related to eating places. Yeah. And then the restaurant piece. Sewing, needlework, um, trade, vocational, and specialized school. Everything else was out. Okay, the next one. Yeah, we left assisted living open. The only reason is we, we would just want to open if for any reason we did change use. Chair Coleman and, and oh, commissioners, sorry. if I may, now we are also now under the uses that require a CUP. So whatever circled here would have to come back to your commission for approval anyway. So we really don't need to deal with item 17 to 0.24 then, right? Because those will have to come to us anyway. It, it may be wise since he's gone to the effort to okay. go ahead and do it. All right, all right. And then a banquet venue, Gary was okay with that. We debated about a helipad, but we checked it off. <laughs> I, I do have to, I, I might have made an error because we have, a, we have an, a huge animal lover in ours, but I think we, we agreed to not do a kennel. Sorry, Mary. Scientific research testing services, that was okay. There's no, nothing on that page. Sorry. Go in order here. So sorry that that would be um, we were okay with accounting, auditing, advertising agencies, bank savings, um, business management consulting services. Um, basically, every, okay with everything on here except daycare, nursery, um, family, social service, clinic centers, and uh, palm reading. <laughs> Gary didn't want that. And then post office and public utility administration. Gary said no to the post office because of the election. That was a joke. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're we're about halfway through. Okay, everything else was okay here. No television, radio, broadcasting station. Um, no temporary offices. No dwelling for use by a caretaker or night security. No public utility structure. I'm just going down all the lists. I don't know if I'm saying stuff I shouldn't. Uh, no water pump stations, no bail bond services, no body art establishments, no garment, clothing, pressing, alteration, and repair. He thought there was already enough around there. Um, everything but a recycling center on this one. Okay, I 
think this is C1 now. So we did no to I think it was like a large large department store apparel. He said no. Automatic um, automotive service station. We said no. No to a bakery. No to Christmas trees. No to church, excluding schools. There, this was all related to just other churches in the area. Um, no to firework sales. No to garment cleaning. No to grocery stores, including meat, fish, etc. Because of competition. No laundromat. Um, and no private service clubs or lodges. Um, okay to rest, oh sorry, no tobacco stores, no video disc tape rental stores. Um, some of this is duplicative. No temporary offices. We weren't sure what to do with, I don't even know what a specified store shop, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> okay, we'll just be, make it okay. And, and this is again, similar to the previous one. Um, actually, we circled kennels on this one, so Oh, I'm sorry. We circled kennels on this one, so I'll, I'll need to be more clear on a kennel. Yeah, so the only... I'll take it out. Let me know if I'm going too fast. Okay, sir. Sorry. Okay, we're almost done. This should be the last one. So we said. It was again, we can't see it. Sorry. And I, I might. I might want to just clarify the restaurant, the restaurant item. I'm not, because I know we crossed off a couple of the restaurant ones. I think we made, we left a normal restaurant. <laughs> There's so many different restaurant ones, so I might have to ask for a little clarification on that. Yes, yeah, so we wanted to avoid drive throughs and, um, okay, and I think that's it. So the question really is to Ms. King, how are we going to codify that? Well, uh, Chair Coleman, it won't be codified. It basically will just be a deed restriction recorded on the property. And the city itself won't have a way to enforce it. It really will be the neighbors or the people that are impacted by the, the potential change in the use permitted. So what I would suggest would be that um, the applicant basically would self-impose the deed restriction and, and list the uses that he's agreed to today um, to, allow, to expand the property on. So the ones that he circled, identified by the applicant, and then that would be recorded um, on the property. So how do we make a motion tonight to allow you time to you know, work that out, which also gives him that conditional use permit that he needs to have? if we choose to do that. Um, commissioners, what we were thinking is that you could vote on the zone change today. Um, it's still gonna go before uh, the city council for a final, final approval and give the applicant the time to uh, produce the, the deed with the outlined uses permitted. And if he doesn't meet the, de the deadline, then potentially we wouldn't move forward. So when he went to city council, he wouldn't have met one of the elements to get approved then? Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, Mr. Bell thinks he knows how to structure a motion yeah, that will I think work I do. I'm going to give this a try. I would like to make a motion for, oh, anything Thank else? Is there something else? Is there more questions? Oh, yeah. I just have a question. Sorry, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Sorry. Sorry, and I really appreciate the applicant and all of this work, but it just seems like we're going through a lot of hoops. Um, can I ask a, like a very potentially simple question about the CO zoning that is never a simple question? <laughs> So CO allows medical offices and clinics. Does this distinguish itself because it's inpatient care and not outpatient care? And that's, and is that a verbiage that could be clarified and amended and therefore make this a approved use within a CO zone and avoid having to deed a property with all of these crazy? Shouldn't we just do that letter instead of having a form up? But that, and that's my question. So I think uh, Mr. Johnson and I spoke about this earlier today. Like, can you just get a sense of the time that that would take if that was something that we could, an alternate route that wouldn't put crazy deed restrictions on a property for an administrative matter? I'm just curious. Call it a 930 question. I don't think that we can interpret that, that this use would be similar to that. Um, this, this, the CO zone like that is more for day, day use. And, and not for extended stays or, or really for overnight, which is why you don't see hotels in the CO zone, generally speaking, mm -hmm. not a CUP. <laughs> Except on this site, yeah. <laughs> Let it be known, yeah. Um, and, and so really what would need to happen to modify the ordinance would, would be, again, as I had previously spoke, would be a referral to add this type of use into like a CUP for the CO zone. Yes, and that process would be through council and it would take it would, to, uh, I would, I, I'd have to say four to five months. Which would not help the applicant out. So I would say at that point, I just thought I'd ask the question. And um, if, I mean, as I said before, as we all said before, we're very excited about, contrary to what it might seem right now, we're very excited about what you're bringing to our community. And um, I mean, I guess if everyone is happy and I'm just over here confused, then uh, let's proceed. Well, I think that's another uh, an, right. an item for another day that we need to address that gap in the in, in the uh, in, in the ordinance. Mr. Uh, Commissioner Bell, did you have a motion? Yes, I'm ready. If I may, I'll give it a great try. Ms. King, and, you know, pay attention here so we can. One quick sure uh, note: I too am uh, very um, excited about your investment. Best of luck. We'll be praying for you. We'll be lifting you. I mean, good luck with this and. And uh, great that you're coming to our city and our neighborhood. So my motion is to approve a C2 PCD, PCD that would be referred to our council with deed restrictions from the proposed developer as he has listed and as our staff has recommended. Did I do okay? Anything else there? I'm sorry? I still want our, us to have some review allowance through the PCD. I said C, uh, C2 PCD overlay. I'm sorry. So they're going to still have to go. Well, your oh, your your question is asking if they got to come back through the uh, and do a specific uh, plan, right? Let's do it this way. Sorry. Can we do this, as Mr. Chief? You can amend my uh, amend my Just question. Okay, please. Question. Um, the, what this side of the room was, was hearing was the uh, exclusive PCD, it would revert back to CO if this applicant didn't, didn't comply. It didn't so you perform. Understand. So we want, okay. Yeah. Well, okay. That's the oh, that's a different, that's I'll clarify, it wasn't that. this side of the room. You it was what? brought up I by. I got stuck in my old C2 land, didn't I? Uh, my apologies. No, I, no, I, no. I will amend my. I will amend my motion that we would have a exclusive PCD. The other one didn't revert. Got it. Okay. Am I, am I, y'all okay? No. Hold on. I don't think we're on the same page. Then why would I go about, because we already, sorry, can you speak to the PCD? Because I thought we were going forward. Uh, you're in control. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I'm in control. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Hold on. All right. So, uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, can you help clarify? Can I possibly revise the motion? Because I think that what we had agreed upon with the applicant at this point is the approval of the C2 zoning with the deed restrictions. 
documented and that is a, a parallel route to the PCD conversation is my understanding. Yeah. And I would be happy to make that motion because I see a lot of nodding heads and I thank the applicant for talking through that. Uh, Chris, so, do you acquiesce? Nope. I, I will acquiesce and I will second that motion. All right. So Ms. King, are you clear what the motion is? And is that, is that satisfactory to council? Yes, a C2 with a deed pending restrictions. Okay. All right. Uh, we have a, we have a, oh yeah, yes sir. It's just, on, just on the timing for me to get this done and make sure everything's good, could, could I buy a little time if I miss the city council? Could, could there be a, how much we, time do I have? We're actually not, we were ordered not to bring anything back to the city council until January. So probably oh. the second meeting of January. So you, you probably have between now and oh. January, January. So I'll just work with you guys on getting you a deed restriction well, code. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Are we good, are we good to go here? Yeah. All right. So we have a uh, motion by uh, Commissioner Cater and a second by Commissioner Bell. I'm sorry? Did you give a copy of that paper to uh, the council? Does she know what we're doing? It was shown, but just not very well. Yeah. So we it, have it on video. We have it on and this is recorded, so we have a, re a recordation okay. of this. Yeah. All right. Is that satisfactory to you, uh, Ms. King? Who was the, I'm sorry. Who made the, the second? Uh, uh, Commissioner Bell made the second. And, and do you have enough documents to support that? Are you going to get copies from him or what are you yes, going to do? Yes, I'm, I'm going to get copies. All right, thank you. All right, is everybody satisfied? We might move forward with a vote. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. We're going to, yeah, let's go do a roll call vote on this. It only lets you vote once. It we voted sleep this already? Oh. oh, that's okay. We don't know how to use this thing anyway, so it's just like, let's call my name. <laughs> Mm. Commissioner Coleman? Yes. Commissioner Rednick? Yes. Commissioner Bell? Yes. Commissioner Bowers? Yes. Commissioner Cater? Yes. Commissioner Lomas? Yes. Commissioner Wade? Yes. Congratulations. Motion passes. Thank you. Yeah, Commissioner, Commissioner Lopes, I want to thank you for leading the uh, discussion on that because it's a very complex issue and uh, I appreciate your uh, thoughts on it. So thank you. All right, so uh, that brings us to uh, item number seven, which I think we should kick on to next time. Yeah, we can, the workshop can go. I'm sorry, yes, the workshop is a go. No, no, the workshop is no. delayed to the next some other time. Is that, are we down to that? Are we down to workshop? You want to stay we, another we, hour? <laughs> How long is the president? You want to listen to Mr. Johnson? No. <laughs> ten minutes. You want to do it? Let's do it. Jump Get over what? What's ten more minutes? Let's do it. Yeah, workshop. All right. Take care. Thank so we, we we do have an overview of the economic development programs here in ba Bakersfield. Uh, we have Cecilia who's going to present that. I'm sorry, what was your name? Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, I'm Cecilia Griego. I'm a principal planner in the economic development department with the city. Well, thank you very much for coming here this late at night. So <laughs> we appreciate you uh, presenting your uh, workshop. Thank you. I just, Dana's going to put up my presentation real quick. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this off for a minute. Oh, all right. All right, again, I'm Cecilia Griego. I'm a principal planner with the city's new, I have to say, Economic and Community Development Department. 
So I'm here this evening to just talk a little about, about kind of what we met up to. As you know, oh, where's it going? Use the keyboard. Okay. With the passage of the public safety and vital services measure, Measure N, the city, that, which identified um, several measure priorities, and one of the ways the city um, decided to, to address those priorities is to bring back its economic and community development activities and expand on those. So as you can see, I won't list them, but you could see a lot of, at least four key ones um, really are under our uh, new department's scope of work. This is basically what was created. Um, um, we have three, as you can say, units. We have economic development, community development, and our new um, homeless services. Um, I'm just gonna talk about the economic development department, which is um, my realm of things, just a little bit about some of the business support and incentives we've started, um, the redevelopment activities, um, and we also still, I won't really get into these, but we also still do, do some affordable housing and historic preservation work. This is my team, so um, if you ever, you know, way to reach us, so if you ever you know who we are. <laughs> we're small, but we're, we're getting started. <laughs> um, kind of what I'm gonna go over a little bit today, um, Basically what we do is we respond to requests for information. Um, we, um, we help guide new businesses through the development and per permitting process. Um, some of the incentives is we've, the city council has established economic opportunity areas, which I'm gonna go over with that. Under the redevelopment realm, we work on finding resources, funding, and initiatives to implement our downtown vision plan. We have um, used EPA grant funds to do a brownfield site reuse program, which helps with um, environmental issues on certain sites. We are also working on a grant called the Transform Climate Communities Program, which is um, a way we can implement the downtown vision plan. It's another uh, funding source that the state offers. You can get more information on that at our website at bakersfieldtccplan.org. Um, now I'll talk a little bit about our economic opportunity area plan. As you can see in this map, there's established areas that council adopted where they want to focus this incentive. Really, it's kind of like our former redevelopment areas, areas where you haven't seen much private investment and growth, where there's still a lot of vacant industrial uses, but also a lot of, you know, our core area in town where we want to see more private investment and growth. Um, so this council has established these um, seven areas. The goals of the EO plan is to develop and encourage new business, promote existing business and retention and expansion, and, in sport and support economic development activities such as new and existing development, infra infrastructure improvements, and also offer financial incentives. I'm gonna go a little bit into the incentive program that we've gotten started so far. We are offering site improvement and rehab, um, rehab grants where um, businesses can apply for grant funding to support facade improvements, site enhancements, which is like non-structural, you know, sidewalk, parking lot landscaping, and then tenant improvements, which is the more interior building improvements. This is kind of a visual example of what that could be with, you know, a facade change, um, sidewalk improvements, and tenant internal upgrades. We also offer development assistance if a business plans to either um, open a new business or move into an EOA area. So we'll help with any of their new develop, help offset some of their new, de any new development fees they may have or any um, conditions of public improvements that they have to make. Also, um, the expansion grant um, covers like real estate costs, moving rent up to a year, um, new business license or, or business permits, moving costs, new furniture, equipment. So just ways we can encourage um, private sector growth in these areas. Another, um, something we've gotten started, um, we've dubbed it Pick Bakersfield. As you know, our new logo is a guitar pick, so I thought that was a nice uh, way to use it. 
So um, in this, it's an online site selector too. So businesses looking to, to move into the city or grow, this is a way they can find property, both industrial and commercial and office space. Um, it's a really interesting tool. They can, you know, it's a, you can zoom into the map um, and really look in. You can also look at data. Some of the data they can look at, not only can they find sites, they can also pull up, um, they can like circle a mile radius like I have here in the picture, and they can look up workforce data, labor force data, which shows them what their potential employees might be, demographics, consumer spending, what their customer base might look like, typical wages paid in the area so they can assess, you know, what they might need to pay some of their employees, competition surrounding businesses. Like, for example, here what I did is I looked at, let's say you want to open a special to clothing store. In a mile radius, I was able to sh see what other specialty clothing stores are in that vicinity so they can see what, you know, who their other um, customers might be. And sometimes those kind of corresponding business can support each other. Sometimes when you have like a, a cluster, sometimes people like that too. So different ways of looking when you want to look and expand your business. You can also look at city zoning and um, links to some of our incentives. Like um, they can, if it's an EOA area that I just talked about, they can pull that up on the map too. So it's, you can go to pickbakersfield.us. So I encourage you to go and explore. It's a very, um, very interesting site. Another initiative we've gotten started is um, one of the things we measure in past, we really realized we had a lot of questions. So, and we also wanted to know more about our market, what's changing, what's not, what are our weaknesses, threats. We really wanted to get a baseline analysis done. So we hired the Nadelson Dale Group to prepare an economic development strategic plan. And some of the key tasks that we'll have under that plan is a, like an, a market analysis and economic outlook, a comprehensive analysis on our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, a business sector analysis where we'll look at you know target industries and clusters where, you know where there's growth, where the trends are, um, you know as you know you know the economy is always changing, growing. There's new and emerging markets. Um, you know what what can we go into that can make us competitive? Um, also looking at consumer demand, you know, where, what, where are we underperforming as far as business, like what consumers are going out of the city to buy, like what if we don't have a certain amount of stores or a certain type of um, retail that would make sense that can come here. Um, we're also um, doing a lot of outreach with the community and also um, doing City Council workshops. Our next one is actually November 18th, so if you want to tune in, you'll get, get an update from our consultant then. Um, and then the key deliverable will be that economic um, strategy with you know key, a key action plan to go with it, and also a marketing blueprint. Um, and when you think about the plan, um, we really wanted to see um, a nexus with what the city's kind of existing economic goals and where that could be as far as policies. So this, this document will really help the city think about what kind of economic development programming and policies that make sense and where we can target that. So these are kind of the next steps. Our consultant is wrapping up our preliminary research and data collection and that's pretty much what they're going to present on uh, to council on the 18th. Um, they're still doing some community outreach, but we've done a lot of it. Um, we've done, we, you know, with businesses, developers, um, community organizations, it's really been a, a we've, we're working with the chamber and a lot of organizations to really reach out to the community. Um, and again, the point is to identify those tools, resources, policies, activities, partnerships, that are essential to um, support our economic growth. We expect the preliminary draft of the strategy to be in the late winter, early spring. And I kind of want to talk about, like, a lot of times people think economic development, there's a lot of things that go in it. It really is very broad, very inclusive of a lot of different activities and a lot of different participants. The city 
has a role, but there's also the role of other um, layers of government. There's the role of businesses. There's the role of of schools and institutions. They're really when you really need think about economic development, you really got to think of that community collaboration. So that's one of the reasons the city has joined with the county. This is kind of what I just said. Is just there's a lot of players involved. So the city has joined with the county, the chamber, the um, current community um, foundation to come what they're dubbing uh, B3K Prosperity Project. It's called the Better Bakersfield and Boundless Curve Regional Action um, for Economic Prosperity. So <laughs> it's really involved a lot of people um, to really bring together a collaborative ev effort and really figure out a roadmap a roadmap and an investment plan for economic growth at the city and at the county level. These are just some of the partners involved. As you can see, we have our key colleges, the um, Community College District, um, CSUB, Current Community Foundation, the Chamber, the Current Economic um, Development Corporation, and what we did, and we're also working closely with the state's um, Region Rives Initiative to really bring, like I said, they've created an executive committee of community stakeholders and we're bringing in the Brookings Institute to do that market assessment, which come out, which should come out in the next couple of weeks to really figure out where, where our next step should go. And this is just a, show, a visual of what that executive committee looks like and the rep representation that on it. There's you know labor unions, business, um, government, uh, community organizations, education, workforce, um, other kind of intermediaries like the Economic Development Corporation and other organizations that kind of work. That's where the, the chamber would fit and everything like that. Uh, and just kind of their overarching outputs and goals for this project is to really think they have kind of three key things of growth, prosperity, and inclusion. So they really want to, they're looking at jobs, outputs, entrepreneurships, also looking at what prosperity, what wages need to be so people can have, you know, a, um, can live, you know, in a home and be productive members of society. What, what thresholds should we build towards in a way? So it, I think it's a really interesting project. There have already been a few articles in the newspaper about it. I don't know if you've caught those, but um, it's something to really pay attention to. Um, this is just a little bit of what we have in the works. Um, some of the things were, hopefully I'm going to get these to council in December um, for authorization, small business loans for those impacted by COVID, um, some micro enterprise startup grants, uh, technical assistance for those impacted by COVID. Um, I'm working on a development process guide um, to help, again, help through that development process, help streamline that. Uh, we're working on an ADU development incentive program, uh, setting up an affordable housing trust fund, and, um, and, this, and also doing a development fee assistance for affordable housing. So a lot in the works. Uh, and this is probably only a third of it. <laughs> So just a few highlights, but I think a lot of exciting things that we're working towards. Again, I just wanted to show our website um, where you can find us, where you can find updates on what I've just talked about, and where you can uh, find a link to that Peak Pick Bakersfield site. Um, so if you have any other questions for me or anything, and I'm done. <laughs> oh, I told you I was fast. <laughs> Thank you. I'll open up uh, Mr. Commissioner Bell. Well, Cecilia, how are you? Goodness oh. gracious, I haven't seen you almost <laughs> through the whole COVID. So uh, I know, I've been hiding, right? Uh, you're out hiding. I'm oh. doing all this work. Secretly. Well, <laughs> so uh, what I'd like to do, and I'm sure many of my uh, fellow commissioners uh, know you, but Cecilia Grego is literally the hardest working person in our city <laughs> staff. And so many people take credit for her hard work <laughs> and the <laughs> volumes and volumes of things that she's accomplished. And I've been able to see it, uh, I, gosh, I don't know how many years, 10 years plus. Uh, so congratulations. ECDD is one of the most essential departments we could possibly ask for in this city. <clears throat> and with all disclosure, I benefited from it 14, 15 years ago when the city acquired the lot across from me. Uh, they paid for it. I bought them out of escrow and allowed me to build a wonderful center downtown and uh, worked with uh, 
work with ECDD a lot when it was more active. So congratulations, great report. I can't wait to see what uh, you all do for the city, and I would love to see our commission somehow more deeply involved with what exactly ECDD does, and I don't know how that would work, <laughs> but maybe our uh, chair might uh, figure that out here in months to come. So uh, God bless you, and thanks for the report. All right, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bell. Uh, Commissioner uh, Rudnick, please. Uh, I say I got a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Um, number one, I want to echo uh, Commissioner Bell's comments. I'm excited that economic development's back, and I'm, I'm assuming the state gave us money or something. What? Oh, what measure happened? in. The residents gave us money. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, self-funding through the community, which is terrific because we're investing I, in ourselves. I echo his comments. It's a, it's a wonderful thing, and it really helps get our community cooking again. So. It's terrific and it's great to have uh, the city involved. So it's really good. And uh, yeah, that was about it. I'm just excited. It's yeah. a good thing. Yeah, a lot of good things. Yeah, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Anybody thank, else? Thank you, Commissioner uh, Rudnick. Uh, Commissioner Cater. Yeah, Cecilia, I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, again, I am just, it's great that the Economic and Community Development Department is back. And I think. Um, I'm particularly excited for the uh, TCC grant application process, which, um, and just I think, yeah, being able to compete on an economic level as, as a city again is really exciting. So uh, thank you so much for the presentation, sure. and uh, don't give our 10 o'clock timeline <laughs> any uh, thought that we are disinterested. We are just going through. Uh, we're on hour four or five now. So. I was just doing my Christmas shopping in the you know in the uh. room there. <laughs> But thank you so much, uh, and yeah, you're welcome back anytime. Right, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to thank you as the former chair of the redevelopment agency. Uh, you know, I have a lot of interest in what you're doing. I like the executive committee that you've assembled with a different uh, uh, mixture of uh, business and uh, uh, clergy and uh, other stakeholders, and I, I like that a lot. I'm really glad to see it back, so thank yeah. you for what you're doing. All right, thank you. And I think that leaves us, uh, we're done with that. And we're going to move on to uh, communications. Uh, Mr. Johnson, do you have anything to say? No, we have no comments at this time. <laughs> All right, then. Do we, uh, do we have another meeting in November, Mr. Uh, Johnson? Th there is one scheduled, but uh, right now it does not appear we will have any projects for that meeting. All right. That would be a shame. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, commissioner comments. Any commissioner comments? Uh, commissioner Lomas. Paul, could you please contact the Gary Simmons, the homeowner on that project? Because we kind of did a whole bunch of stuff without him being here. Can you reach out to him? Yes, we have his contact information and can do I that. Thought Absolutely. You did. All right, thank you. Any other commissioner comments? All right, leaves us to adjournment. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>